All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, before we actually call this meeting to uh, uh, into order, we have to elect a temporary chairman tonight, as the uh, chairman and the vice chairman are both uh, out this evening. Uh, both of them are okay. We hope they'll be back to see us at our next meeting. And so at this time, I'm going to uh, ask uh, the county manager to um, take over for us for a minute so we can elect a uh, temporary chairman for this meeting. Thank you, Commissioner White. Uh, so I'll call the meeting to order. Uh, the um, July 19th Currituck County Board of Commissioner meeting and I'll look for a nomination for a temporary chairman for this evening's meeting. I nominate Chairman Bob White. Second? Temporary Chairman. Temporary. chairman. Got a, a motion and a second. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. I'll turn it over to you. Temporary Chairman White. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, as my battery's going dead, I'm going to get a business card. TC. In just a second here. Okay, um, a little out of, uh, out of practice here, but uh, thank you all for allowing me to step in this evening. Um, uh, Ben's already called the meeting to order, so um, the next item on the agenda this evening is the invocation and pledge of allegiance. Um, we don't have anyone uh, signed up to do the invocation tonight, but uh, Sheriff Matt Bikert's here tonight, and we'll lead us in our invocation and pledge of allegiance this evening. <coughs> We ask for your blessings, your mercy, your goodness, Lord. We ask for your wisdom and knowledge for everyone that is here at this meeting, Lord, that you would bless us. We thank you and we give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Thanks, Sheriff. <laughs> Next item is the approval of the agenda. Does anyone have any changes or additions to the agenda this evening? All right. Can I have a motion to approve? Second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Uh, next uh, item up this evening is public comment. I have one person signed up this evening. Uh, is it Key Store? Key Story? Storf. Storf, sorry. Good afternoon. Uh, also got Fire Chief Ryland Pointer with me. So say on Monday, April 12, 2021, the Crawford Township Volunteer Fire Department participated in their regularly scheduled ISO inspection with North Carolina Department of Insurance. The Crawford Township Volunteer Fire Department entered this inspection with an ISO rating of a 59E, which they obtained in the 2006, when they improved from an ISO rating of a 6. On June 24, 2021, Crawford received the results of this inspection and once again improved their rating to a 490. To put this accomplishment into perspective for you, only 22% of the fire departments nationwide hold a rating of four or better, and only 18.6% in the state of North Carolina hold a rating of four or better. We would like to thank the commissioners, the county manager, and our auto aid and mutual aid departments of Moyoc, Lower Currituck, and Camden for their support and assistance as we could not have accomplished this without their support and yours. This is not something, something that happened, happened overnight. overnight. It's, it's a, a long-term hard labor. Uh, this started with uh, fire chiefs that, that served our fire department way before I did to set down the groundwork. Uh, quite a few of them, especially Wilson Snowden, Chris Daly, Kenneth Furl. As Keith said, uh, partnership with our neighbor fire departments and everything, help from this board that helps us finance our operation every year. So uh, it, it's a pretty big deal for us, it's something we're very proud of, but it's not something we accomplish by ourselves. So thank you all. Oh, great. Thank you. Congratulations. <clears throat> Uh, I didn't have anyone else signed up for public comment. Is there anyone in the audience that would like to speak this evening in public comment? All right. Seeing none, I will close public comment and move on to the next agenda item, um, which is the commissioner's report. And your battery's in great shape. Um, and tonight I'll uh, start to my left with Commissioner Jarvis. We'll just swing around to the left okay, today. Okay, thank you. Um, I just want to thank the Board of Commissioners and the county 
for allowing uh, Commissioner Etheridge and I to attend the National Association of Counties National Convention in Prince George's County, Maryland last week. Uh, we attended sessions and discussions. We heard from national policy leaders about COVID responses, American relief uh, plan funds, and other issues like broadband access um, and health responses, uh, especially a lot of emphasis on mental health. Uh, through that rhetoric and uh, some of the politics that was there, uh, one thing resounded to me, and that is how lucky, honored, and proud I am to live in a county like Currituck. Um, to end the, one of the closing events at the conference uh, was a very inspiring speech by a guy named uh, John Odnesic, who is better known as uh, the musician, songwriter of Five for Fighting. He uh, told us about how during the pandemic he had taken over running his family business, which makes shopping carts apparently, and how that uh, resilience had come about. And uh, he used songs, of course, that he's written. And towards the end of his uh, discussion and his speech, he finished with the song and the story about his music or his song called What Kind of World Do You Want? And I just want to say, as I drove back into this county, I can pr proudly say the kind of world I want is right here in Currituck County. So I appreciate the opportunity. So thank you. Great. Thank you. Sassers? Thank you, Mr. Acting Chairman. <laughs> First, since I serve on the Social Service Board, I'd like to recognize the outstanding work done by these county employees. The state recently conducted an audit of the Curry Tuck County Department of Social Services Child Welfare Unit. The purpose of the audit was to assess if social work staff are correctly using federal funds for child welfare cases. The audit concluded that Curry Tuck County has correctly determined eligibility and appropriated utility, utilized federal funds for child welfare. The agency had no monitoring findings that required any actions, so I'd like to say congratulations to a job well done. Next, I'd like to report on a very busy week that I've shared with some of my fellow commissioners. We participated in two ribbon cutting projects for the citizens of Curry Tuck County, something that you should really be proud of. The Maritime Museum at the historic Kerala Park tells a wonderful story of the maritime history of our county, both the recreational side but also the business side. Make sure if you're in that area you visit it and you too will be proud of your heritage. Then if you're up in Mayock, you need to stop by the Shingle Landing Park with its walking trails, its playgrounds, its pickleball, it's wonderful outdoor area for citizens to enjoy. This is a dream fulfilled for former county commissioner, Mr. Miller. And I also attended the Chamber of Commerce after hours at the H2 OBX water park. What a nice facility in our <coughs> county for citizens and visitors to enjoy. Yes, we do have a lot to be proud of in this county. And like Ms. Jarvis said, I too attended this conference, and it was the first conference held at the hotel in about two years. They had just reopened, and the conference was full of the usual meetings of health and human services, agricultural, rural affairs, and it also talked a lot about returning after COVID. And all I can say is that we in Curry Tuck County have truly been blessed because of the revenue coming in from our rentals. And I know that small businesses have suffered. I know that people have suffered in our county, but God has continued to bless Curry Tuck County. And we as public servants should continue to serve the great people of this great county. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Essers. I'll go to the other Commissioner Essers. Anything for you this evening? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, first off, I want to publicly thank the Mayock EMS crew that uh, chauffeured me to Chesapeake General a couple of weeks ago. Their professionalism, the dignity that they treated me really points out just how good of service our EMS providers do in this county, and we should all be proud of what they do. 
Second thing I'd like to talk about is um, we have a lot of farm equipment that moves up and down roads, especially Tulls Creek Road. And my understanding is we had a bad accident on Tulls Creek Road involving a car and a tractor about three weeks ago. And I'd like for us to request to DOT that on our secondary roads, they put sm slow moving farm equipment signs up and down these roads because people, for whatever reason, they don't realize that tractors might be running 15 miles an hour, 20, and they run up on them running 50 and 60. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it will prevent anything, but at least we can make the effort of asking DOT to erect these slow moving farm equipment signs up and down our roads. Uh, Tulls Creek Road is one, East Ridge Road in Shawboro, uh, Narrow Shore Road over um, in the south end of the county. So I would like to see us write a letter to DOT asking for that. Um, I understand there was a meeting held in Raleigh about three weeks ago where our chairman, Mike Payment, the county manager, met with Representative Hannig and Senator Steinberg and the people from DEQ trying to accelerate the uh, process of coming to some solution on the Eagle Creek sewer system. And I'd like to thank them for doing that on behalf of the citizens that that uh, system serves this very much needed and I too along with the other commissioners attended the Maritime Museum and the Shingle Landing Park opening these are very nice facilities and they're a testament the Maritime Museum is a testament to the history and tradition and culture of Curry Tuck County and I can see our school children, uh, Superintendent Lutz, going over there and spending a day and looking at the history of Curry Tuck, excuse me, looking at the history of Curry Tuck County. And I recommend every citizen of this county go over there and look also to utilize the Moyoc Shingle Landing Park. That is a great facility and it's only going to get better. So, um, Mr. Chairman, I think that's about everything I've got, and I appreciate uh, the opportunity to make these comments. Thank you. Sure. Commissioner McCord. All right, I, um, I got a few here. The, um, like our um, Commissioner Etheridge is funny, uh, you never know where you are, but I um, had a, a medical emergency and I had to have a uh, appendix removed. Owen, uh, Commissioner Etheridge was two rooms down from me as I was forced to walk the hall multiple times and I didn't even know it. But um, like I said, I'd just like to thank, I got a lot of nice messages and, and, and I made it through eight days sitting in my house not being able to work. It was pretty tough. But um, but that was probably the hardest part. The, uh, the fireworks show that we had in Kerala on July 5th, due to the change every day, we didn't do it on the 4th because too much traffic. Uh, the fireworks show was awesome. That was my first day back to work. Um, and everything went great. Um, there's so much new stuff going on in the county. It's, it's, it's crazy. I mean, the, I did attend the park opening, a ribbon cutting, which is a, a 20 acre facility is beautiful. Um, we've spoken with the county manager about some possible, I've gotten about 50 calls about the basketball. We're working on something on that. So if anybody's watching this at home, that's something that we're talking about. Um, the, uh, I missed the Maritime Museum opening. Um, I was there the day before. I worked in Kerala the day before for a long time, and, but I missed that one. But I've been by there. It's a beautiful facility. And uh, if you get a chance and you're in Kerala, go look at it. It's awesome. Chandler Sawyer, um, there's nobody that lives in this county that's probably put his heart harder into that facility than him. His grandfather's photos in there multiple times. And like I said, that's an awesome facility. Tamron, I know, is in the back, our tourism director. She's done a great job. They, it's, that park's really, the Wellhead Park, it's, it's really turned out nice. And that's kind of like a final piece to it. Um, other things new, the public safety building. We're going to have a ribbon cutting for that in a couple weeks. Um, and not many people know this. I went to the police academy, BLET, in 2021, 20 years ago. This year will be the first year Curry Tuck County hosts the uh, basic law enforcement training program is now at our COA campus. So not only is the public safety, but COA is expanded with different I don't know all the programs, so I'm not going to try to name them. But I know that the um, the fire and EMS have a bunch of stuff there for training as well. 
Um, that facility is just top notch. Sussex has done a great job. That's going to open in roughly a month. The 16th, so just under a month. Um, if you get a chance, go by there. Uh, you might be going to COA to take some classes there. It just kind of really completes that, that area. Um, and then I think that's pretty much it. The um, Like I said, there's a lot going on in the county. Same thing. Traffic's terrible on the weekends. It's just like, you know, back in the day. Um, be careful when you go somewhere. Um, drive with some some common sense I guess and just you know if, if it takes you a little bit longer to get there it takes you a little bit longer to get there and that's it thank you Commissioner Cord uh, well I think everybody covered the uh, Maritime Museum that's pretty much all I had tonight for myself obviously as a commissioner for Kerala um, it is a great it is a great facility uh, I'm very proud to be uh, a commissioner especially at this time in Kurtuck's history there's a there's a lot going on um, if it wasn't for the foresight of, of previous boards and um, and then most of this board actually was uh, sitting when we decided to actually move forward with that. Uh, we've had some naysayers say that that facility shouldn't be in Kerala. It should be on the mainland. And uh, they're wrong. Uh, it absolutely belongs in Kerala. Uh, it is a uh, historic park for a reason. And it tells another piece of our history here. And so, as, as everyone's pointed out, if you are here on the mainland, you may not want to go over this summer. But <laughs> after the tourists are gone in uh, September, October, it is worth going over there to see um, all the efforts that have gone into making that facility what it is. And um, I believe the uh, county manager is going to talk about that a little bit in his report. So that's an easy segue to the county manager, Mr. Steichleather. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. So with the Maritime Museum, um, once again, beautiful building. I uh, reached out to Chandler Sawyer, who's the um, manager of that facility. And he said that on Friday, the first day that it was open, there were um, a little over 700 people that came through that museum and that as of about 3.30 today there were 800 people. So, I mean, you know, that's a, you know, great, um, you know, great visitation into that facility. It's going to really spread the history of Currituck County and, you know, help to preserve that. It's a project that I'm really proud to have been a part of. Um, and I want to give a, a little bit of a shout out to Michelle Perry, the, um, our assistant county engineer who's the project manager on most of our vertical construction projects. She does a phenomenal job and, and you can see that when you see these projects that come to fruition. And um, the design of that building, the construction of it, and then the, the work that was done on the inside by the tourism staff getting information. Alex Alex Perry who did the videography, I mean it's top notch. So it's something everybody should really be proud of. Shingle Landing Park, once again, a um, little over 4,000 feet of um, walking trail, sidewalk out there. It connects to several subdivisions. It really ties a community together out there. There are other phases at some point in the future. Um, you know, so I'd encourage folks to go out there, use it. If there's something that we need to fix or address, feel free to reach out to Parks and Recreation. Um, you know, anytime that you've got a, a active use space like that, you know, you're going to try to plan for how people are going to use it, and then they're going to use it the way they want to, and so you have to adjust to that. So. Um, but we're excited to have all those projects moving forward. Um, it is the heart of, of tour season right now, so everything is really busy. All the reports that we get say that it'll be one of the best uh, seasons that we've had in Currituck County. Um, with that comes some some challenges as far as traffic and other things. Uh, but we've we've been really blessed that we've had um, some really good guests come to our county this year. They they really enjoyed it. We've heard a lot of positive things. Um, other than that, the the county is doing a phenomenal job as we head into a new fiscal year. We're closing out the old one. There is a joint meeting this week with the uh, Board of Education, Board of Commissioners, where we'll be talking about the capital plan as we continue to move forward. That will involve the expansion of Moyak Elementary School, Moyak Middle School. We're, we're through some of the design work on that, so we'll be presenting that out. And I believe that we'll be having a discussion about the um, you know, where we go from here as far as we've uh, got a closing plan for a new property on Tolls Creek Road for a new elementary school. And also the school is finishing up a uh, strategic plan for capital planning purposes. And so that'll, that'll help to inform where we go from here. So we're excited about that joint meeting that we're going to have here in a couple of nights and be happy to answer any questions any board members may have about anything. What was the night again for the joint meeting? I couldn't remember. The joint meeting is the 21st. Okay. Did, uh, is Eileen worth a sheep finally? Eileen will be uh, retiring at the end of July. So, um, We've got an employee who's retiring after a lengthy career with the county. She's worked uh, for the county attorney as a, as a paralegal. She's been a you know, project manager in the county manager's office. I think the one thing that she has done uh, as good as anybody could is build relationships with those folks in the Outer Banks. She's really been a, 
a liaison and a great asset um, so that if something came up they people had somebody to reach out to she's going to be greatly missed but we we sure do wish her the best on her her retirement i think her plan is to head towards uh, some family maybe grandbabies in uh, the rocky mount area but well deserved she's she's, she's done a lot for this county and it's, it's another one of the another unsung people that you don't think about but um, if you're in Corolla the last 10 years and been around any project, you've seen her there, and her fingerprints are all over yeah. every project that's taking she's, place over there. She's so. great at what she does. The Greenway's a real t I mean, that's a project that she's sure. seen, I mean, for over, you know, yeah. a decade just yeah. about. I mean, and so it's, that's a real testament to the work that she's put in and the care that she's shown for this county. Absolutely. She will be missed, uh, so we'll wish her the best. Um, is that it for you this evening, Mr. Steichleiter? That's all I have, Mr. All Chairman. All right. Thank you, sir. Uh, next up is the county attorney's report. Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, at, at one of your recent meetings, I reported to you that at the May 24th uh, administrative session of Superior Court, the senior resident judge has scheduled for hearing this morning in Superior Court uh, a show cause order as to whether uh, for the uh, plaintiffs in the RF London Mermaids Headlights case uh, show why their matter should not be dismissed for failure to prosecute their claim. Uh, for reasons unknown to me, that matter was removed from the calendar uh, last Thursday uh, without the county's consent. Um, the presiding judge this morning, Judge Waylon Sermons, also seemed somewhat confused. He set the matter for hearing at the September 13th session of Superior Court. Also before the court this morning was the county's motion for partial dismissal of the uh, Corolla Civic Association lawsuit against the county uh, regarding the expenditure of occupancy tax revenue. The, the motion asked the court to dismiss the Board of Commissioners as named party to the lawsuit, to dismiss uh, former county manager uh, Dan Scanlon uh, in his official capacity uh, from the lawsuit or as a party, and to also dismiss the eighth claim uh, in their lawsuit, which is a claim that the county is violating the North Carolina Constitution by expending tax revenue for a matter not allowed by law. Uh, Judge Sermons quickly dismissed Dan Scanlon in his official capacity, in fact, making note that the former county manager should never have been named as a party to the lawsuit. And just as a note, the plaintiffs had already dismissed the claims against Dan Scanlon in his personal capacity uh, in 2019. Uh, he also, dis the judge also granted the motion to dismiss the Board of Commissioners as a named party because it is not appropriate to sue a Board of Commissioners, which may not be sued under North Carolina law. It is a suit against the county, which is proper. Um, and then he also uh, ordered dismissal of the North Carolina constitutional claim. Um, the, the, to me, the important aspect of dismissing the Board of County Commissioners as a named party is it refutes once and for all a claim made by one of the plaintiffs uh, to this board um, prior to filing of the lawsuit that you, you commissioners would be held individually liable for uh, repayment of occupancy tax should a court rule that the county had misused the occupancy tax money. Uh, that, by this dismissal shows that was a wrong assertion then, that's gone. Um, and so the next steps will be probably mediation sometime uh, late this summer, early fall. And then it appears that we're going to be on track to have a hearing the week of November 29th, we hope, uh, on motions for summary judgment to determine whether this matter might be put to bed uh, once and for all. With regard to uh, real estate matters, we closed last Friday on the uh, county's uh, Uncle Graham Road lot uh, with the Armstrong family. In fact, Ms. Armstrong actually uh, submitted a bid on behalf of her son, so she assigned her bid to him, and we conveyed the deed uh, into her son for him to begin his new home on that property. He was very happy and pleased uh, with the acquisition of that property. It now also returns to the county tax records, uh, tax rolls. Um, and then secondly, the uh, acquisition or closing on the Tolls Creek Road school site property uh, should be occurring now in August as we've completed the due diligence period without any finding of deficiencies uh, in that property or uh, relative to the phase one environmental survey that the county uh, received, which was clean uh, as well. So we'll be, we'll be proceeding on that uh, in August and we'll report that to you when that closing has occurred.
That's my report. Thank you, sir. Any questions for the county attorney? All right. Appreciate it. <clears throat> All right, next item on the agenda is uh, administrative reports. Item A, uh, the Sheriff's Office presentation of advanced certificates. And we have Sheriff Matt Bikert here this evening. And Commissioner McCord, you're going to be part of that as well. hundreds of hours of training and some over a thousand hours of training. So we're very proud of them and we want to honor them because it is very significant and we want to show our commissioners and our community uh, that we are seeking the highest levels of training and education uh, for our deputies. I'll, uh, I'll read one of them and then just pronounce or um, award the other one. Um, this is a North Carolina advanced certificate by virtue of the authority vested by the law of the state in recognition of the attainment of training and education objectives uh, commensurate with the role of a professional law enforcement officer and of personal devotion and service to the people of North Carolina. The Attorney General and the Chairman and the members of the North Carolina Sheriff's Education and Training Standards Commission uh, through the authority vested in them by the laws of the state, hereby award to William Daniel Davis his advanced certificate. Sergeant, if you come on up. So this means a lot to us, means a lot to me, means a lot to the agency that we can honor their achievement because it, it is very significant in the law enforcement world what they've achieved. So thank, thank you very much. Thank you. All right. And in keeping with the uh, Sheriff's Department this evening and, uh, and our fire department, um, we have a resolution honoring Deputy Caleb Edwards and Firefighter Keith Storff this evening, and Commissioner McCord will be presenting those this evening. This is a, uh, <coughs> the other deputy, like we would, uh, would like to raise, as well as fire, uh, yeah, red, fire, red and blue go good together. Um, these two uh, selfless gentlemen, I'm going to just give a little brief little synopsis of what occurred. On the 11th of April, uh, barely the 11th, but right around midnight, uh, Deputy Edwards, who was on duty, he works on Sergeant Capp's night shift here on the mainland, responded to a structure fire off of Tolls Creek Road. 
Duffy Evans was the first one there on the scene. Uh, the neighbor who called in, I guess, from a couple houses down, say, say that there were still individuals in the home. The home was, I don't know the percentage of the fire, but the, the roof was on fire, the porch was on fire. It was a pretty heavy fire, which was not going to take much longer before it was going to be fully engulfed. Um, Deputy Edwards was the first one to enter into the building because he knew there were two occupants in there. He successfully brought the first occupant who was actually in hospice at the time and literally carried him off out of the house to the um, front yard. When he got out of the house, I believe that's when um, the fire department started showing up and um, uh, firefighter Keith Sore, who was one of our paid firefighters in Knox Island, correct? And not Tyler, as well as he's a volunteer at Crawford. Um, he's in their administration there who volunteers nonstop for the, um, you know, for the county as well as the pay fire. They arrived and he assisted um, Deputy Edwards get the individual um, to, the, to the front yard away from the fire. After that, they both assisted um, getting the, uh, the female um, from, from the porch as well. Um, like I said, it, it was... Um, you know, I mean, these guys just, you know, without hesitation, just there, assist, you know, help out. Um, both two hardworking, dedicated guys in the county. So we um, had these plaques up for both of them. Um, I'm just going to read one of them. Uh, it doesn't take around. Basically, it's just a resolution of the Curtis County Board of Commissioners and appreciation for the service of Sheriff's Deputy Caleb Edwards, as well as firefighter. Keep sore uh, to assist with Perfect County, North Carolina. Uh, like I say, before the 11th, two, uh, 221, 2021, Perfect County Sheriff Deputy Taylor has responded to the truck fire. We've got two occupants in the house confined in life threatening circumstances, uh, brought them out of the house and, and everything. So, this, um, therefore, this resolution by the Perfect County Board of Commissioners that on behalf of the citizens of Perfect County, the Board of Commissioners acknowledge. The life-saving action of Deputy Edwards, as well as Firefighter Keith Swords, and extends appreciation for the dedicated service. And this is adopted tonight. Uh, our chairman's not here to sign these, but he's like, so we could have Deputy Edwards come up. Uh, he also got a, uh, a life-saving pen. Um, from the uh, sheriff's office, we'll take a little photo. Yeah. Hope the camera don't break. I've taken probably too many times. <laughs> um, but like I said, uh, Deputy Evers has been with us four and a half years. Three, 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 yeah, three and a half. Okay. I'm off a little bit, but um, like I said, great guy, hard worker. I know his family's here. They're proud of him. Um, I remember when he first got sworn in. I knew he was going to be a good guy. Did his uh, background over everything, and I mean, just, just I was like, this guy's never done anything wrong in his life. <laughs> you know, he really is uh, it's an asset to the county. If you want to have your uh, family come up, they can to take a picture. Just recently had a baby, oh, and it's a good baby, because I'm not having a her cry. Oh, yeah. All right. Yeah. <laughs> now I'm a kid like <laughs> Good job. We appreciate it. Uh, and the same thing, uh, if I could get firefighter Keith Sorf to show up. I've been working with Keith as well for, for over a decade. Um, selfless, always doing for the county if, as a paid fireman or as well as volunteer. He's not being paid as a fireman a couple days a week. The man at the fire station is pretty much a second house, but uh, good job. And, uh, we appreciate what you did. Um, no problem. Thank you. These guys, both of them, you know, I mean, numerous at Rex, whatever it is, I mean, for the county, they serve the citizens as well as guests day in and day out.
Chief Pointer, and also we have with us this evening is Ms. Finnerty, uh, who is the one resident, and I believe her daughter, who were two of the individuals in the house. Uh, today is also Ms. Finnerty's 82nd birthday. Today or yesterday? I know it was. Um, sadly, uh, as Kevin uh, mentioned, uh, Mr. Finnerty was on hospice at the time of the fire and did subsequently pass away a couple weeks later. Um, but we were glad that at least he had that extra time with his family to have that ability to say goodbye and not from the fire. Uh, real quick to repeat a little, there in early morning hours, Sunday, April 11th, 2021, the Crawford Township Volunteer Fire Department was dispatched to a reported structure fire at 2091 Tulls Creek Road. I was the first arriving unit within moments of dispatch, found the front side of the structure well involved with flames coming through the roof. I could hear a male ye subject yelling, your house is on fire, you need to get out. I then received confirmation from a neighbor that the residents of the home were still inside and the voice I heard was that of a neighbor, Mr. Gary Johnson. I quickly called the rescue on the radio and donned my safety gear. During this time, Deputy Sheriff Caleb Edwards arrived on scene and made his way to the rear of the structure. Deputy Edwards joined Mr. Johnson at the rear of the structure and began initiating the rescue of three residents in the home. I met Deputy Edwards and Mr. Johnson at the rear of the residence, and together we finished removing the remaining residents from the Weldon Gulf home and out to the street side where they were out of danger. Where I'm a trained firefighter and equipped with the proper gear to protect myself from heat and smoke, Mr. Johnson and Deputy Caleb Edwards are not. These gentlemen placed the safety of their neighbors and residents of the county above their own by placing themselves at great risk and danger. Because of their heroic actions, three residents escaped harm and none even required medical treatment as a result of the fire. The Crawford Township Volunteer Fire Department would like to recognize this gentleman for their acts of bravery and hereby present Mr. Johnson and Deputy Sheriff Caleb Edwards with the life-saving award. Ms. Fenner, would you like to come up with this? Mr. Johnson, there's also in front of the black and reeds for your heroic actions, which directly resulted in the saving of lives at the scene of a residential structure fire on April 11th, 2021. Just there, so you can turn around trying to get up that step. Yeah, if you can just turn around. Mr. Johnson. I think that's a, a fitting uh, reminder this evening um, of what our police, fire, and EMS, sheriff's department do for us. Uh, the men and women that serve in those capacities, they run to the fire, they run to the danger, they run to the bullets, they do everything in their power uh, for selfless acts to protect the people that live here in this county. So thank you all for all you do for us. And um, with that, I'll take a brief five-minute recess. and. Um, a couple people need to get out of here this evening, they can, and we'll reset in a few minutes. Thank you. All right. Uh, All right, everybody, we'll call the meeting back into order again um, and continue on this evening. 
the administrative reports. Item C, um, uh, we're going to see some of this more frequently. It's uh, departure uh, as, um, as um, department head updates, something the new county managers added in. This evening we have the uh, Currituck County Librarian, Laura Salmons, here to update us on um, what's going on at the libraries. Good afternoon. I'm Laura Salmons. I'm the Curtis County Librarian. I'm also the Assistant Director for the East Albemarle Regional Library System, which the county is part of, um, along with Derek, Camden, and Pasquotank counties. Um, just a kind of a summary of our experience with the COVID-19 situation. Um, it placed the, the library staff in a, a unique situation as libraries and staff tasks are heavily weighted towards direct public service, direct face-to-face -face customer assistance. Um, I heard a quote that said, we may not have all been in the same boat, but we're all weathering the same storm. So I thought that was a pretty good uh, summary of everybody having to find new ways to do things. And um, as noted, with the libraries being very public facing and with that staff seldom have enough time to review the online content available to the communities we serve. We have numerous databases, um, Cloud Library, which is a collection of digital ebooks and e audiobooks, um, Overdrive Digital Magazines, NC Kids, which has over 31,000 titles, um, NC Live, which is, hosts numerous databases, and these offerings change fairly frequently as well. So, in the beginning, self directed learning and discovery of these resources was assigned to help our staff become more familiar and confident with our unique features and tools available. And this uh, strengthened their ability to serve the public by recommending and assisting patrons in the successful use of these resources. Um, people think of libraries, and a lot of times they just think of books if they haven't been in there lately. And with libraries, it's much more than that. You kind of have to know something about everything and where to find it. So this was a really good opportunity for us to um, brush up on some things and, like I said, numerous resources that we otherwise don't have time to kind of do a deep dive into. Um, and in learning more about the many resources offered, our staff worked on plans to better promote those offerings as well. Um, coursework from various professional websites, such as the State Library of North Carolina, uh, the American Library Association and other public library systems was assigned, with staff also completing detailed daily work logs. So assignments and webinars varied um, depending on the staff member's specialty, their area of interest, um, and individual job duties. We have um, youth services staff, which plan and implement all of our um, youth programs, story times, uh, summer reading, that kind of thing, um, genealogy, outreach, adult programming, um, and social media and marketing. And all of this uh, resulted in the development of new marketing materials and informative handouts, um, new or revised programs and resources created in-house by staff. Uh, we also put together some staff that were interested um, in creating a social media and marketing team for the library. And uh, that consisted of staff at the Barco and Mayock libraries and uh, to enhance our digital presence and our marketing efforts for when we do resume um, in-house programming, or on-site rather. Um, we received a generous donation from a local donor um, for staff training at the beginning of the, the COVID shutdown. Um, with this donation, Amber Jarvis, Youth Services at the Mayock Library was able to complete a six week, um, I'm sorry, six course certificate program in early childhood literacy, uh, which aligns with Every Child Ready to Read initiative that we've created a story time manual for and programming. So it kind of makes our story time um, sessions more structured and um, more of a kindergarten readiness program. And then the donation also provided fund funding for Janeth Murphy, a professional genealogist at the Mayock Library, to complete an 11 course professional learning certificate in genealogical studies for um, advanced li level librarianship from the National Institute of Genealogical Studies. And both these staff um, immediately, everything they've learned, have turned it around um, and instantly applied their coursework, resulting in new programs and resources. And they also completed all of this while doing their daily tasks, serving um, the community, assisting patrons, and um, just kind of, they've really gone above and beyond. And um, as many of our staff have, 
it's like I said, public facing, and you pretty much had to recreate the wheel on how we were going to serve the community. So, um, in every aspect, our positions were, were um, revised a bit, and staff did a great job at that that flexibility and that change. On um, May 26, 2020, uh, full staff full-time staff returned on site, and we began offering curbside services at all three library locations. And um, the curbside services included library material recommendations and checkouts, um, requested tax forms or forms in general, printing and faxing services, and to-go programming. Um, basically, we reformatted any on-site program into a to-go format. So um, with story times, each week you could pick up a new packet. Um, homeschool groups that had previously met. Um, Amber had redesigned those programs to be a to-go format as well. Um, we also did some adult programming, um, like a, uh, gratitude packets and a tranquility kit, quit, kit, which I think everybody was in need of um, at that point. And from May 26, 2020 to March 31st, 2021, staff conducted over 10,000 500 curbside transactions. So um, they stayed really busy um, in that capacity alone. And uh, we, we had stopped our outreach trips to patrons' homes for library book delivery just to reduce the potential exposure. And luckily, we were able to collaborate with the Senior Center and Stacy and the staff and uh, the Meals on Wheels volunteers have helped by delivering um, library materials to patrons on their delivery routes. So. That was a great partnership. On April 19th, 2021, all three library locations reopened to the public. Um, and with that, um, we also, it was posted on the county websites, the library website on the regional um, page, and a, a the county issued a press release. We have um, signs at all three locations noting that we're open and also offering um, curbside for people that feel more comfortable in that, that service. Um, and the reopening was highlighted on all our social media outlets. And we also resurrected our monthly newsletter in April to reach patrons who may not be on social media. And um, we also reached out to our elementary school contacts to highlight the reopening and promote the upcoming summer reading program schedule and provided flyers to those who expressed interest in distribution. So this past quarter, um, this is kind of the, almost the first full quarter that we had reopened the facilities to the public and total circulation was 14,258 items um, compared to 1,600 the previous year. So it's definitely ramped up. Um, we've conducted 89 notary appointments and just in this quarter and 217 new patrons um, receive library cards and compared to 218 in 2019. So we're getting, um, I'm sorry, 218 in yeah, 2019. So it was just one shy of our pre-COVID numbers. So I really feel like we're um, kind of rebounding from the last year. Um, and more so than that, kind of come back, coming back a little stronger, it seems like our numbers are trending higher. Um, so, and we're seeing daily higher door counts, um, distributing double the amount of summer reading packets compared to last year. Um, this year, the Milwaukee staff created a, an adult summer reading challenge, and as well as a teen summer reading challenge that has already accumulated over 25 participants. And if you've ever worked with teen programming, like 25 participants is kind of the equivalent to 100 people. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a huge accomplishment, um, especially coming back from the last year and a half. So um, we're continuing to revise and establish new programs and resources for the community. And uh, just thank you for your support and the opportunity to continue our efforts over the very complex past year and a half. Thank you. Any Comments or questions? Uh, the library's busy. I mean, like I said, all mm -hmm. the libraries, every time you ride by, they do a good job. Uh, I, myself and the county manager have talked about how great we have staff. And I mean, it's just day in and day out. I mean, like I said, we get a lot of compliments. I just want to say that your efforts to help uh, children read is uh, a way a community really helps the schools build in that foundation. And I just really appreciate all the efforts for the uh, children that are. 
Um, we had re moved some things out um, to allow for social distancing, and so some of our rooms were used to um, house those items and furniture and things. So as we're moving things back, they are becoming more and more available. Um, I believe now they're um, available during open hours. That's a question I've been asked. I've had the same one. Mm -hmm. I know Chairman Payment's sick tonight. The um, or it's not a the on a COVID update, I had sent him a message earlier. I don't think we've had a COVID case in the month of July. County Manager, do you? If you'll let me look that up as we go through the meeting tonight, I'll have that answer for you. Because I've gotten some phone calls on that too. Okay. Thank you very much. We appreciate Thanks. you coming out this evening. And all you do for us. All right. Next up, uh, we have. Um, Trillium Health Resources Annual Report, and uh, we have Mr. Bland Baker here, the Northern Regional Director. Good evening, sir. Hello, how are you? you you're pulling my thing up. So, um, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, I'll be brief, got a full agenda, just um, a few highlights of what's been going on with uh, Trillium this past year. As you can imagine, it's been a challenge, it's been a challenge for all of us, and Truly has not been any exception. So, um, anyway, all right. So I'm just going to move forward. Um, what you already know, we're 26 counties. Mm -hmm. um, we did have a request in the last um, few weeks from Bladen County to join Trillium, and um, we did accept them. But now the decision rests with the Division of Mental Health and whether they approve that or not. Anyway, so we served 58,000 people um, last year. Um, we managed a network of about 500 providers across our 26 counties. Our services, the dollars that we spent on services this past year was $475 million. So um, I want to talk about two things tonight, which is really the biggest challenges that we've had this year. Uh, Medicaid transformation is one of them. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with that term, but it's um, it's the intent of the General Assembly to move Medicaid from a basically a fee for service to a uh, managed care service. So this is the biggest transition probably for the Medicaid program in 40 years. Uh, I know I've not seen it in my lifetime, and so have I need to have a lot of other individuals. But anyway, so uh, to start the process off, um, there are basically two plans. There's a standard plan and a tailored plan. Standard plan, um, the RP was posted and only commercial insurance companies were allowed to bid on that plan. So they awarded it to the five insurance companies that, that you see um, in front of you. These plans will manage the mild to moderate behavioral health symptoms. See, prior to this, this uh, went into effect July, this, this July, uh, prior to that, we covered all the services in mental health consumers. And now um, we're going to lose about 70% of um, that 58,000. So I think um, that, that we actually served. Um, but anyway, um, these are the five insurance companies. Um, they had an open enrollment. Um, all the um, recipients got a letter, a packet in the mail that were mandated to sign up for a standard plan. A lot of those individuals didn't sign up at all, which I'm not surprised at that. Um, probably not enough education from at the state level that, that went into that. But um, so for two months, they were allowed to sign up for a standard plan. They had an enrollment broker they could call with an 800 number in that packet to help them guide them through the system, how to make those choices for themselves. Um, and then May the 15th, if you didn't sign up for a plan, they put you in one. And so, of course, everybody got their cards mailed. And, you know, and, you know I think our communities struggle with a lot of, of, of um, information that they receive and the way they receive it. So uh, anyway, but they were actually auto-enrolled. 
and uh, beginning of July 1st, um, the extended plan was implemented, and um, they actually served the low to moderate needs of the mental health um, individuals along with the physical health and the uh, pharmacy. So um, now to talk a little bit about the Taylor plan, which is only the MCOs, like truly, I mean, they are work seven of us across the state. Um, with the merger of um, Cardinal and Baya, there's only six now. But um, anyway, uh, we were the only ones that were allowed to apply for a uh, Taylor plan. So we actually sent our application in um, in um, November, and we were supposed to have heard something uh, June the 11th of, because um, we may not get a plan. I mean, it's possible which would mean that they'd have to take those counties and give them to someone else. So um, we've been waiting since June the 11th, and we still don't have, don't have an answer. So hopefully um, by the end of, of July, maybe we'll know who's going to be a, a tailored plan and who's not, and we'll have another year to implement that system. So... Um, so what, that, what that's going to look like is um, we'll, you know, the standard plans are doing something they've never done before. They're managing Medicaid dollars. That's something that we've always done. And now we're going to be managing the physical health, something we've never done, and we'll be managing the pharmacy benefits of those individuals who have moderate to severe mental health symptoms. So that means we've got to get contracts with all the primary care physicians. We've got to get contracts with all the pharmacies. There's certain um, staff that we have to hire. Um, we have to have a, a partner that's a standard plan to help assist us with the physical health side of what we have to do. So that's why we've got another year that we've got to work on this, but um, we're still waiting to find out if we're going to be selected or not. So. And one of the other focuses of the tailored plan is the social determinants of health. If, if our basic needs aren't met, then that jacks up the, the cost of mental health services for individuals if they don't know where they're going to live, if they don't have food. A lot of those issues, and we have a lot of people in our communities who are struggling with those very issues long before COVID happened. They were still struggling. So that's going to be another big focus of um, what our tailored plan will be addressing. So um, that's, that's a very very 30,000 foot overview, but I want to talk a little bit about what um, we've done in terms of COVID and what that has really meant to Trillium and our our communities and uh, folks that we serve. Um, we did set up a, a separate webpage so to educate as many of our folks about COVID, what, what it meant, um, where the um, vaccines are being given, so they would have another place that they can figure that out. We paid a lot of rate increases to a lot of providers. Initially, nobody was providing services. But we didn't want our providers, um, that we have good providers, to go out of business. So we paid them some retainer payments. We raised their, um, their rates so they could continue uh, to pay those individuals until we figured out what we were going to do to help support the providers and how they could maybe provide the services a different way. And now that's going to be a challenge, but we have rewritten just about all of our service definitions um, that have gone from face-to-face -face types of services. They've made use money to buy iPads. They um, have used a lot of telehealth in services that don't typically utilize that, um, that way of doing business. But that was the only way that we could figure out how to um, continue the services for um, our individuals. One of the other things we did, we waived all the authorizations, because there is an authorization process for service. And um, to be sure people meet medical necessity, we waived all of those. So if you need a service today, it can start today. There's no wait period. There's no waiting to find out whether they meet criteria or not. Um, we put together a lot of COVID kits for our providers. Um, for some of our day programs, we took provider kits that um, our consumers could take home with them. Um, let's see. So that's a lot of things that we did with um, 
with COVID-19, and we had some projects that we also did that were related to that as well. So, for example, we did um, hand sanitizing stations at all the playgrounds that we had funded a few years ago. We put um, hand sanitizing stations at all those. Um, we actually had a um, launched a website, Safe School Tech for Kids, um, first of last year. We actually had um, some contests among the schools in our 26 counties. It's a, it's a website we set up that's free for school personnel, for parents, for kids to go online on that website and do little trainings that, they, that helps with suicide prevention, that helps with um, bullying in school, those kinds of things um, that kids struggle with when they're in school. And um, Subra won um, one of our awards. We gave a $5,000 check to the school to use ever how they saw fit as how they needed to. And I think they told me that they bought desks when they were looking at spacing kids, I believe, when I took that check. So um Trevor did win one of those um one of those those checks. And actually in my ten counties I had three schools. One in Camden, one in Pastor Tank, and one in um in Currituck. So I was proud of the outside. Anyway, um, uh, other things that we continue to do is the not some kits. We've been doing that for a few years, and we continue to um, purchase those from the North Carolina Harm Reduction where we've got dollars available. Um, so and we've done that already twice this year, so we continue to do that. So specifically uh, for Currituck County, I wanted to mention other than the $5,000 award that the school got, um, we do continue to uh, contract with two providers that offer mental health um, training and offer mental health um, services, outpatient therapy, to the Curtis County Schools through a contract with Pride North Carolina and Integrated Family Services. Um, gets the other contract, and you know, they're the ones who provide the mobile crisis for for the uh, community, so they continue to provide that service um, in uh, in the Currituck County Schools. So, just in closing, um, served 1,069 individuals uh, for Currituck County last year. Uh, 541 of those um, had mental health issues. 150 of those individuals had substance use issues. And um, uh, 79 of those had intellectual and developmental disabilities. So, any questions for me? Is that fluent? I have a question. The, the numbers as far as um, the, the 541 and the 150 and the 79, mm -hmm. the total 1069, was the, um, I mean, and this, how much up was that than probably 2019? Do you know off the top of your head? Um, it's close. Um, there was not a lot of change. Um, at least not in these numbers. And um, I know mobile crisis, and this is from the sheriff's office. When we deal with a lot of times, they, I know that they assist on a daily basis. Right, absolutely. You know, with well, and and that's a one good thing about them. They contract with us. It doesn't matter what kind of insurance you got. It doesn't matter if you have any or not, or what it is. If if they get called to the scene, they're going to go and they're going to help support. Um, and they worry about the payment on, on the back end. The consumer never gets any a bill for any of that. So that's basically how our contract works the, with them. But. The county uses them frequently. I think last year, and that's why I was just asking compared to 2019. I know 2020, we use mobile crisis a lot. Really good. Well, that's great. Well, yeah, I, mean, that, I mean, yeah, because it's getting the yeah, citizen yeah, help that needs it, and, and they do a good job. Um, so I just was just was well, curious if how much I that was up. Kurtuk is a is a great example of of how you work with mobile crisis because not all of our law enforcement have that same relationship. I'll say it that way. Um, we have some magistrates that will call mobile crisis if they get IBC paperwork before they ever send a law enforcement out there to pick somebody up to be sure that they qualify for the IBC. I think I know you all use them quite a bit. If you get a call, you call them, maybe they'll meet you there, maybe they'll go out and um, try to support you all. And, you know, if it's a mental health issue, you can go about your business. 
and the no process can take over from that side. Anyway. We use them a lot. The county does. Any any more questions for me? No, sir. Thank you very much. Okay. Appreciate you coming out this evening. Yes, sir. All right. Next item up on the agenda this evening is public hearings. Item A, PB 20-12, Carolina Club Homeowners Association has a request to amend the Currituck County Unified Development Ordinance, Chapter 4, Use and Standards to allow shared parking of major recreational equipment as an accessory use in major subdivisions approved and recorded prior to January 1, 2013. And Ms. Donna's up and ready. Thank you. Good evening, members of the board. Um, Aisley Miller, who is the agent for the Carolina Club Homeowners Association, submitted an application that would allow for major subdivisions recorded prior to January 1st, 2013, to be able to establish an area within their subdivision for shared parking for major recreational equipment. Major recreational equipment usually is something along the lines of boats, RVs, campers, uh, motorhomes, or travel trailers. Daryl Hood, who is the president of the Carolina Club HOA, also approached us well over a year ago uh, looking to do some things with property that they had purchased from the developer. And they had a couple of properties out there, one of which in particular they wanted to do some uh, RV storage. But what we identified is that in order to do it, they, needed to, they, they would need a text amendment. And although this proposed text amendment is being presented by the Carolina Club HOA, if the board approves this text amendment, it would be allowed countywide for those residential subdivisions that are approved and recorded prior to January 1st, 2013. And that date, that January 1st, 2013 date, is the date of the adoption and effective date of our current UDO. The request amends the accessory use table, which is uh, section 4.3.2 of the UDO, and it requires a special use permit for this shared parking. And again, it is for existing recorded residential subdivisions, specifically in the agricultural district, the SFM, which is single family mainland district, the SFI, which is the single family isolated district. Uh, most of the residential subdivisions that were recorded prior to January 1st, 2013 did not have an area set aside for RV and boat storage. There are a handful that do, but most of them did not. And if you own property in one of those subdivisions, you either have to store your boat on your individual lot if your restrictive covenants allow that, or you'd have to take it to one of the self-storage facilities and rent a space there. And um, the Carolina Club is looking to provide an amenity to their development. Uh, and unfortunately, the way regulations are currently written, it would not allow that, which is the reason for the text amendment. The specific standards associated with this text amendment can be found in packet page 14 and 15 in your agenda packet. And it requires that the property must be owned by the HOA or the Property Owners Association. And it must be within the subdivision boundaries of um, the development so that subdivisions aren't acquiring property way outside their development specifically for just storage of recreational equipment. The storage area cannot be in required open space. The equipment may not be connected to any utilities such as water, sewer, um, electricity, or gas. It's just being stored there. And it cannot be used for housekeeping purposes. No one could live in it. That's the purpose of making sure that there's no utility service there. Uh, all equipment parked or stored at the facility must be owned by the property owners in the subdivision so that they're not leasing out spaces to others outside of the development. And all equipment shall have a current year's license and registration and be maintained in good repair. You don't want these areas to be turned into um, long-term yeah. storage of equipment that 
really has served its purpose and its lifespan and needs to go on somewhere else. You want it to have current registration. Uh, it has an enlarged parking space. It's 12 by 40 with no parking allowed in the drive aisles. It also requires a type D buffer along all property lines. And the, one of the reasons for that is, is you're looking to place this in established subdivisions. So you, you might have residential homes adjoining mm -hmm. this area. They may be inside the subdivision, they may be outside the subdivision. And placing this tight D buffer uh, around the area helps buffer that, that use um, and deal with some of the compatibility issues. So type D buffers are currently outlined in our ordinance. They, there are two options for those. There's a 25 foot buffer and then there's a 10 foot buffer, both of which require vegetation. And um, you have the option with the 10 foot buffer, if that's what you choose, you have to use a fence with landscaping or the 25 foot buffer, you can use uh, a combination of berm and fencing. Um, and any masonry wall could be used to screen any type of equipment, but it's doubtful you'll see that. Most of the time it's usually vegetation, sometimes with a fence. So our current ordinance does have provisions in, in the language that actually requires subdivisions if you have 20 or more lots in your subdivision and you have an average lot size of less than 20,000 square feet, you have to provide a central location where you store your equipment. Um, the, and this, it's limited to those types of things, recreational wise, uh, boats, boats, trailers, and similar equipment. Um, it has a requirement that you have one, two spaces that are um, 20 by 40 for every 20 lots in or 20 dwelling, 20 dwelling units. So it puts a dimensional standard to those when you're looking at the number of lots in a subdivision, a, a calculation, so to speak. This proposed text amendment does not provide that, that option, um, which is somewhat of a concern, uh, the size of the facility. Uh, some of these subdivisions that are recorded prior to 2013 have a large number of lots associated with them. There are a couple that uh, currently have facilities inside their development to give you some context of what, what this would actually look like. Uh, Eagle Creek subdivision has 426 lots and they have an area set aside that's about a little over an acre and a half. It's partially fenced and vegetated. It's located along the boundaries of the development and uh, was approved as part of the subdivision. Laurel Woods Estates also has a facility inside their development that was part of their initial approval. Uh, Don, Laurel, let me stop for a second. Uh, 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 so under the, the current, the newer subdivisions like Laurel Woods, uh, are we finding that those are big enough to service the needs the way it's written we just, haven't just since heard, we're talking about it yeah we haven't heard that they are not okay uh, that's the minimum standard that's in okay. our ordinance uh, that doesn't mean that they they can't have larger area I know like in River's Edge where they have their lot storage in that picture I guess it was probably a few years back because there was a in the previous one there was a because kind of an eyesore if you live across from it they put like a uh, my company I've maintained that for complex for 12 years we put like a big uh, landscape in bed, which everybody drove over everything when they were parking their boat. So we ended up getting rid of it. But I know like with theirs, I mean, they have like a little bit of a weight, like somebody moves, somebody gets that spot. You know, some of the ones, I believe them and River's Edge, and I think Laurel Woods, I believe they charge, you know, it's not a arm and a leg because mm -hmm. it's cheaper there than it is like if they went to right. a storage facility. But what's the, like when they have those, anybody that's already there, that has one, use Laurel Woods or Eagle Creek or even River's Edge. For example, when they have one there, say like the requirements they had, hurricane comes through. I know, you know, in a couple of those, it's tore out some of those trees. Are they required to put those back? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, they should be replaced. Any damaged vegetation should yeah, be- Yeah, they have to maintain. Should be replaced. Um, 
Like going back to Laurel Woods, good question. Uh, there are 160 lots in Laurel Woods subdivision, and they have about a half an acre set aside uh, for for this storage. Yeah, it seems like every time I've ridden through there, none of them are actually in the lot. They're in somebody's yard riding through there right now. I guess that's an internal <laughs> I problem. I think for there them. might be a problem with I the facility problem. being full. Right. Yeah. That's <laughs> so most of them are full, except right. for Eagle Creek. I don't yeah. think there's as full. So that, that's why I brought that up, um, mm -hmm. just <clears throat> since we're talking about it. So. Yeah, I mean, it, like I say, it is it is not common for subdivisions unless you're required to do so to provide that type of storage. And what you're seeing more often in these residential subdivisions are restricted covenants that re that do not allow you to park your right. boats and RVs in your front yard, or um, sometimes they don't even allow them to be parked in the yard at all. So they're forced to um, rent a space outside of the development, mm -hmm. and they're becoming harder and harder to find as well. So as I mentioned, we've been working with Mr. Hood for some time now to try to find some language that would best manage those compatibility issues that we felt needed to be addressed, you know, adjacent land uses that you might have established homes along the perimeter of the development, either internal or external. Size of the facility is also a concern. And the noise that could be generated from the amount of traffic going in and out. If you have boat motors that are start, you know, get, people are probably going to go over there and do a little maintenance. Um, on occasion, just start the motor, make sure it runs. If, it, if it's during a period of time that it's, it's not in use. Uh, aesthetics are an issue. Um, like you said, making sure that it, it's not visible from those adjoining properties. And stormwater, if you're looking at a site that could be relatively large uh, for storage area, making sure that all those impacts are addressed and, and what we typically find with a storage facility. Uh, because if this were a standalone use, and this is where, where it's really important when we were talking about not purchasing land outside of the development, because a standalone use for these storage facilities, it requires industrial zoning. It's not allowed in the ag district, it's not allowed in the residential area, and it's not allowed in the general business. It requires industrial zoning. So we want to be careful and cautious on allowing this, making sure that it's properly screened. Um, I, do, uh, I do have one more question, and it was, I was going to wait towards the end, but where it was talking about major recreational equipment, um, and the one thing, may, oh yeah, right there, that one. If the vehicles and equipment intended primary for recreational purposes, including but not limited to boats, campers, recreational vehicles. Now, I know anything in this amendment, it has to be licensed, um, current license, as far as if somebody had a UTV, we'll say, and if it's street legal, because I know there's a county ordinance where they can't, you know, you couldn't put a spot and put two four-wheelers out there that aren't um, licensed mm -hmm. through DMV and because they can't ride those with county ordinance violation to ride a ATV in a subdivision. So I, if if we approve this, can we, I guess maybe, I don't know what's the word I'm looking for. If we, if, if we approve this, and I'm not against this in any way, because I think it's a great asset as well to the neighborhoods, the... Um, but, I mean, like, stress on that recreational vehicles that they have to be. Um, I don't think when you're talking about recreational vehicles, you're not talking about motorized vehicle, like a side-by-side -side or a four-wheeler, right? That is not. Generally not. Right. Um, well, it's, you it's, want recreational be... vehicle is an RV. Well, yeah, I mean. Right. It's not. So this doesn't address uh, motorcycles, basically, is what mm -hmm. you're talking about. You're talking about a, motor, a, a motorbike of some sort. Yeah, so, yeah. I, I mean, that's why when I saw a motorhome come after a recreational vehicle, right. I was taking, I mean. Thank you. That's probably more of an all-encompassing recreational and motorhomes. Yeah. I wouldn't, it's kind of know, their dual purpose, right? Right. And you, you <clears throat> want to be careful, too, like this doesn't turn into a storage facility for, for cars right. either. So. Um, and that's why I wanted to bring that up, where they have to be currently license and everything because you got somebody new will move down here and they'll buy a half an acre lot in Currituck County and they live in the country and then they can ride their four wheelers 
You know, on their. What's wrong with that? You know, well, I mean, they can't write them on. And it's a county ordinance violation. That's why. So that, that's where it said recreational vehicles. I was like, I jumped to ATV, UTV. The recreational vehicles are defined. Uh, in that, okay. In, yeah. in the ordinance. All right, thank mm -hmm. you. And it does say they have to be licensed. It does. So if it was licensed, if it was a side by side like Bob, if it's licensed, you can ride it all day long. Right. It's like riding a car. Good point. Thank but, you. Um, the other thing that we're looking at has to do with consistency with our ordinance. So section 7.1 in chapter 7 deals with um, open space and the uses that can be applied in open space areas. And one of the concerns that we have from a staff's perspective is outdoor storage areas cannot be counted as open space, although we require this recreational storage area, outdoor storage can't be counted as open space. So what we ask the board to consider tonight in your motion is whether to specifically either allow the major uh, recreational equipment to be parked and stored in open space or not allow it. Um, we believe that it's probably best to not allow it in required open space. Doesn't mean it can't be in open space, it just can't be in the minimum no. required open space because the intent of that open space set aside area isn't for storage. It's, you know, it's intended for um, areas that are free of automobile traffic, unless it's associated with parking for a particular active recreational use, like a clubhouse or tennis courts or um, maybe athletic fields or something like that that you would have inside your development. Um, because this area is, is set aside for uses such as recreational, public facilities, conservation lands, and, or even farming operations and not necessarily parking. So if these developments had some extra open space, they could certainly apply for, for um, utilizing that under this provision. So in the case of the Carolina Club, uh, do they own some lots or something that they're gonna convert to use for Yes, oh, so the, the, the Carolina Club actually purchased two areas in the development. The one in particular that they want to use for um, RV storage was an area that was set aside for future lots and a park, but never really went to record. Um, okay. The preliminary plat had long passed, and so it's, it's basically a parcel of land. So in an older neighborhood that's pretty much fully developed, they wouldn't have a choice then. They'd have to go into an open space, I they guess. They would have to go into open space. Um, and, and then you're looking at uh, if, if they're coming in, if the, if the um, HOA is coming in and wanting to apply this particular section of the ordinance, and it involves dedicated and recorded open space, mm -hmm. then most likely you'll be looking at um, the community and the property owners within that development to consent to the application uh, for that request. How does that work on something like, and I hate, Eagle Creek 99, Eagle Creek came to mm -hmm. the county. Now you have a neighborhood behind it, mm -hmm. um, and if you ride, not just me from being in the police car, you ride through the neighborhood behind it and it has the proper buffer mm -hmm. and everything, but then something comes down the road 10 years later is, and there, there's not a kind of buffer on the back side of that where Lakeview, I mean, is that? In the, in the case of Eagle Creek, they actually do have somewhat of a buffer there, but um, it, you're buying the property knowing that that that's is there. adjacent right. to Okay, you. I didn't know if that was something, mm -hmm. okay. So if you're adding it, you would be required to buffer it. That's the difference. Right, you'd this, know right? it before you purchase right. it. So if you're, so if you're adding, you know, in this case, with Carolina Club, they would they would have to buffer around the property. Right, because could. people may have bought with right. the understanding that that property right behind me or that property across the yeah, street from me whatever. was going to be open space or was going to be residential properties, and now that could affect Your the value. value of my property. Or and the drainage. Least, 
and and that you know that's going into the that's a good segue into uh, the next part of this is the reason why for the use permit and it allows for that adjoining property owner or um, someone in in the community to be able to be present at that evidentiary hearing and present evidence that would either be it it would or would not affect their property value so that's the purpose for the use permit if you have an established property that is adjacent to this and um, you know it it's going to be four acres of outdoor recreational storage of, of a major recreational equipment then it provides the opportunity for that applicant to to present any evidence that they may have um, expert evidence that is mm -hmm. that they may have um, rare yeah that would um, uh, so be for or against that project on your motion sheet that we had here um, you talked about shall or shall not be counted as required open space mm -hmm. and um, and you, you, you talked we just talked about that a little bit but uh, so what I guess what are the differences there so if we if we say that um, it shall be counted as required open space it goes against the, the total open space or takes away from how, how it's, to, it would just be allowed as an allowable use, in, um, open use space. In, in open space okay. we would specify that in the ordinance and if it cannot be counted as required open space it can still be an open space it just cannot be in required open space which is what this text amendment is okay. actually set up for uh, for subdivisions that are already approved prior to January 1st 2013 okay. kind of puts them both in a line off off the top of your head how many subdivisions are we talking about that would be affected by this? So there are not many that have outright property ownership that's not dedicated as open space um, most of the time. So if you look at it from just that angle of, of property that is owned by the association that's not open space, it's probably very, very few. And the question um, is how many actually have an HOA? So most of the newer ones do After since 13. 2013 yeah. do have HOAs. The older ones, they're they're. Although they may have them, they may not be functional. Um, there's there's fewer of those um, than there are today. Because it is required today, and prior to 2013, it was not a requirement. Right. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um. So again, we recommend that it not be counted as required open space. It can be included in open space, just not required open space. And it's, it's not uncommon for some developments to have extra open space as well. Ms. Fulver, I'm mm -hmm. reading here about the equipment should be owned by the property owners. Mm -hmm. So if you rent, you can't store your equipment. That's a very good question. Um, so we might want to to tweak that language if you feel like that that's something that would either rent or own um, residents they must have residency in re the residency, residency within, within the development that's a good very good point property you should do it for your boat there if, there's, if it's available <laughs> is um can I add, is mr. Mm -hmm. hood is he gonna speak so I wanted to ask a couple of questions. he will okay he will. I wasn't sure if you signed up. You, okay. All right. Does that uh, does that conclude your? Uh, or you, you got you got some more for us? I don't. <laughs> Any I'll more just questions? go over this one slide and uh, okay. We'll let we'll let Daryl come All up right. and speak to you. So when you're considering this recommendation for the text amendment, you. We um, staff actually looks at whether or not the application complies with all the review standards that are um, specified in the ordinance. And just to give you a little bit of background, uh, this was presented to the planning board back in March, excuse me, May. Um, and at that meeting, it was tabled so that we could work more with the applicant to address some of the compatibility concerns, which we have done. It went back to um, 
the board and the planning board and they made a recommendation of approval and they asked that uh, this area not be counted as required open space. Um, and in accordance with the text amendment procedures in the ordinance, staff makes a recommendation as well and it is for approval of the proposed text amendment provided the open space clarification is included in the motion. I would also ask that um, as Kitty pointed out, maybe tweaking the language with ownership and put in residency uh, to, to help um, eliminate that issue. And uh, we believe that this request is consistent with the vision statement in the land use plan uh, to ensure that the proposed activities will provide an aesthetically pleasing environment and it is also consistent with land use and development goal number 10 to properly distribute development forms in accordance with suitability of land, infrastructure availability, and the compatibility of surrounding land uses. We believe that this will result in a logical and orderly development pattern that establishes the use, special use permit process to review the location, the design, and operations of the shared parking to determine that they are compatible with the surrounding land uses. I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. I think we may have covered most of them. Questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Mr. Hood, do you want to come on up and talk to us a little bit? Good evening. My name is Daryl Hood. I live at 173 Carolina Club Drive. Um, good seeing y'all all again. Ben Ike, Selena, Kitty, Bob, Kevin, Owen. Brings back memories. Right. It's been a while since you've been on the campaign trail. It's right? been a while. <laughs> so um, first thing I want to do is I want to thank staff that worked so hard to help me get to this point. Couldn't have done it without them. Um, and and uh, the planning board as well. And um, had a lot of points I was going to cover, which have been covered already. So um, I just want to, again, thank staff and the board for considering this application. Okay. Any questions for Mr. Hood? I do have a few. Um, the, the, and I mean, just the, the, what's the lot size roughly of the storage area that you guys are going to have? Uh, the, what we proposed was uh, it's a five-acre lot um, that we bought, and um, you know just our preliminary uh, when we went, went, for, went for bids, it was um, we're let's see about an acre. Okay, is about an acre as preliminary for just for bidding. We wanted we we're looking to get as many uh, spaces as we could, uh, and we try to shoot for around 40 or so. We have in 220 lots, and um, and just uh, we have more and more people moving in and bringing boats in, mm -hmm. and there actually have been people calling up, asking about the Carolina Club to my manager, and do we have a place for them to keep campers and trailers? There's been a deal break on a couple because he's like, uh, if I don't have a place to keep my camper, then I'm just going to have to look somewhere else. But then again, I'm not sure where you're going to go because there aren't a lot of places you can go and <laughs> keep your camper. So right, um, but uh, and we're. Not, where yes. is it? Where is it? The, the is it right there off of? Um, I was trying to remember where is it. Where is the? It's your, right off of Augusta. It's yeah. off of. Um, it's right beside Golf Hole Twelve. Okay. And so there are in the proposed um, parking area. It abuts. I'm gonna say um, three uh, current lots in our association. And then one other lot, which belongs to Harold and Beth Walton. Um, right there on Coons. On the, yeah, on Coons Lane okay. to the north of us. And so those are the only properties that would be directly impacted by it. I mean, I look right down the golf course at it myself. So, I mean, I guess there are others that are at a distance that would still be impacted. Right. Okay. Those, those are the adjoining. Okay. That's all my questions. Thank you. All right. Nothing further. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you all. Um, this is a public hearing, and uh, we need to open up public comment. I don't have anyone signed up this evening. Is there anyone that wants to speak this evening? Seeing no one out there, I will close public comment at this time. 
and um, look to the board for any further discussion or a motion. I don't have the grandy man here, so. Uh, Let me just ask the question just to make sure I understand um, what Ms. Voliba said. Uh, Ms. Voliba, you said that the planning board recommended the language of shall not? Yes. Okay, that's, that's all I Okay, thank you. And I do have one more question. As far as the storm water and just from playing golf at the Carolina Club, I know that area on number 12 is it's probably one of the wetter holes on the golf course besides six and maybe 18. Is that, and the, so the, stor the storm water for, I mean, five acres, they got a ton of property. So um, for what they have to do, there's going to be the requirements and all that and, stuff. And that will be evaluated through the use permit process okay. and the site plan process. They'll, they'll be meet, meeting the storm water requirements. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That was it for me. Mr. Chair, I'll make a motion to approve PB 20-12 uh, Carolina Club HOA and recommend the request include an amendment to Chapter 7, Section 7.1.3, requiring share, shared parking and storage of major recreational equipment shall not be counted as required open space and that the language uh, be changed from owners to res current residents. Uh, because the re request is consistent with the 2006 Land Use Plan Vision Statement and Land Use and Development Goal 10, and the request is in keeping with the provisions of the UDO and the County Code of Ordinances, results in a logical and orderly development pattern, and establishes an evidentiary process that will evaluate the location design operations of the shared parking to determine compatibility with the surrounding land uses. Second. Mr. Owen. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. All right. Uh, does anybody need a break before we move on to the next agenda item this evening? That's good. All right. Next item up uh, under public hearings, item B, PB 21-10, Kirtuck County Text Amendment. Request to amend the Kirtuck County UDO, Chapter 2, Administration, Chapter 6, Subdivisions and Infrastructure Standards, and Chapter 10. Definitions and measurement to allow family subdivisions on parent parcels 12, or 12 acres in area or larger without the required connection to an existing NCDOT maintained street. Mrs. Turner. Good evening. Good evening. It's a little chilly out here in the, uh, in the audience. I don't know how y'all are doing up there. <laughs> So this text amendment uh, before you this evening revises the subdivision standards related to family subdivisions, uh, a special type of minor subdivision. The ordinance, uh, just back up just a little bit. So the ordinance provides for a couple of subdivision options. There are minor subdivisions, which are limited to, to, to creation of three lots, subject to specific standards. There's family subdivision, which is a special type of minor subdivision that's limited to five lots where the, um, the property is conveyed to family members within two, de two degrees of kinship. And then there's major subdivisions, which are basically the subdivisions that are not minor, don't qualify to be minor, or family, or they're not exempt um, according to the ordinance. And, and this is just, this chart is to kind of show you the difference between the minor subdivision and the family subdivision. Um, one of the major dip differences is that the parent parcel date, which is the date where we look at a parcel and then count the number of splits that have been made, lots created from that parcel since a particular date for a minor subdivision. That date is April 2nd, 1989. Uh, for a family subdivision, that date resets every 10 years. <clears throat> Again, there's the max of three lots through the minor. Mm -hmm. What did you say about that? Resets every 10 years. So the parcel, the parcel, um, parent parcel date resets every 10 years. So you would look at today, we'd look at a parcel, you know, splits, um, like your lots created, that parcel date would renew every 10 years. So you could create a couple of lots 10 years ago. Today you could come back in. If you could qualify for the family subdivision process, you could do more splits on that parcel that was previously split, as opposed to going all the way back to 1989. 
and, and I have here the streets uh, at the bottom here of this chart for a minor subdivision. Uh, you can create a maximum of two lots on a private access street. Uh, new private access streets have to connect to, it, to an NCDOT maintained street. And for the minor process, you cannot create lots on an existing DOT street. Now, for the family subdivision, the special minor subdivision, um, you can have a maximum currently in the ordinance, you can have a maximum of five lots on a private access street. Uh, again, that new private access street must connect to NCDOT maintained street currently. And you actually, in a family uh, situation, may create lots along an existing NCDOT street provided it's not a major arterial. So each of those lots, if you ran along, could have a cut, a driveway to the DOT street, if it, as long as it's not a major artery? Is that For family, is? correct. Okay. Right. For family. For the minor, you have to have to build the street. Right. One, one entry point for both mm -hmm. lots. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So for the family, like you said, I mean, what would be considered major arterial would, like, I mean, obviously 34. Yeah, there's, there's a list in the ordinance. It includes the highway, 34. Um, the street right out here, I believe. I can't remember the number, Donna. 615. Um, but they're, the major arterials are defined in the ordinance. Okay. If you want, I can find those and tell you what they are. Okay. Yeah, I'm good. All right. So this is kind of what we're talking about. <clears throat> and again, the language before you this evening revises the subdivision standards related to family subdivisions. Uh, staff did receive direction to prepare this text amendment uh, from the county manager based on uh, feedback from the board, um, and that request did come with some specifics. Um, the direction was to create an alternative family subdivision process um, that the, uh, the provisions would be applicable to parent parcels that were at least 12 acres or larger, um, and that the resultant lots be, be a minimum of three acres in size. And then that there not be a limit to the number of lots created on a private access street. So where you have two for minors, five for families currently, this new uh, provision would not limit uh, the number of lots on a private access street for this particular type of family subdivision. And so with that direction and, and reviewing the ordinance, um, and if you'd like to see the ordinance, I'm getting ready to read through part of it on page, uh, your agenda packet, page 25. Mm -hmm. Staff felt that the provisions were really targeting that access requirement. So instead of creating a whole another family subdivision process, that they, we just incorporate this language into the language that's already in place in the ordinance. Um, so there on your agenda packet, page five, this is in section 2.4.8 D2B of the ordinance, is where uh, specific standards related to creating family lots are found. And you can see that um, additional standard for family subdivisions, that, that they follow the review procedure for minor subdivisions and the following standards. And these standards we have, again, that provision that the lots be conveyed to family members within two degrees of kinship. No more than five lots are created from the parent parcel as it ex existed 10 years prior to the application. Ingress and egress to a lot shall not be from a major arterial street. And then we get to number four here, that private access streets created shall connect to an NCDOT maintained public street and shall not serve more than five lots, except for lots that meet the following standards. So this begins the, the new part of the ordinance that staff has crafted. So I'm gonna go through these provisions and then give you a, a little bit of reasoning for why this provision is, is here in the ordinance. The first part to accept to, uh, for your subdivision to qualify for exception to this private access street standard, the limit of five, is that the parent parcel or tract shall be a minimum of 12 acres in area. Um, and this was specific direction from the board. And, one of the things that this provision does is it excludes lots that were created under the, uh, the state statute, the, the exemption from uh, subdivision ordinance, the 10 acre lots, you know, lots that are greater than 10 acres uh, are exempt from subdivision 
uh, standards. So those would not qualify for this. And so what it does is it just limits the number of parcels that have the potential to do this particular type of family subdivision. Um, in other words, lots created on parcels less than 12 acres in areas shall meet the private access standards, uh, street standards, including the maximum of five lots accessing the street. Provision B is that lots created shall be a minimum of three acres in area in all zoning districts with a minimum lot width of 125 feet. Uh, the three acre minimum lot size was board directed and it will help limit the number of, of lots that can be created through this process. Um, also potentially create some more rural feel of these uh, subdivision lots. And the 125 foot minimum width is consistent with the requirements in the zoning district for the SFR, single family residential mainland zoning district. Uh, we didn't pull that out of thin air, it's in the ordinance already for creating lots in that minimum width requirement. Of C, that existing and new streets shall be in a, a, a improved in accordance with section 6.2.1B1 from an NCDOT maintained street to the lots created. So this provision allows creating lots off of an existing private access street that may or may not currently be in good shape. It may need some improvements in the road. And so this provision requires that before the lots are created that the road um, meet a higher standard or be brought up uh, to at least the standards for private access streets in the ordinance. And that the new roads also meet those standards which include minimum 20 foot road width and uh, gravel. So Jenny, you said new roads, but this would be an ex uh, it's a case of a, it would generally be an existing road, right? So unless they're putting in another drive, is that? It would generally be an existing, so it would be existing and new. So okay. you've got an existing street, depending on how your parcel uh, connects to that street, you may be required to extend that street into the parcel to do this, mm -hmm. or you may be connecting directly to that street. Either, either way, um, this provision would require that that street be improved before the, that lot's created. When you said the 20 feet far is like, there's all, like um, acting Chairman White said, <laughs> the, um, there, all right, there's a road there, and you said 20 feet. What's the fire? Isn't the fire is at 20? It's got to be what? Well, that's yeah. that's the requirement. The it's got to be a fire truck. I thought it was 20 or 22. requirement. Yes. Okay. Um, so that you're saying you guys would like to see this before the lot was carved out, and my thought was that it needed to be done after construction, before a CO. So you've got trucks rolling in and out, lumber trucks doing their thing, right? They're building this lot. You've got traffic, excess traffic on the road. Is that? Should I mean? The, so, Shouldn't so they do they it before into the house, and, and after? I mean, oh, yeah. they before yeah. they're yeah. already they're yeah. potentially already impacting the road that sure. that's there already. Yeah, I'm just thinking about when it's done, the damage that could have been done during that process. Right, you you move in, you've now you got to kind of reset the road basically at that point in time before you get a CO. Mm -hmm. um, Can I ask a question? Okay, so the part with C where you're talking about existing and new streets. Let's suppose I have um, 12 acres, and my 12 acres is on a non-DOT road, and I want to cut out three lots in that 12 acres. If I did one access point for those three lots, would I then have to make that one access point onto the dirt road up to... Uh, the street standards and see? Yes, that's what this is saying. This, from, from wherever that DOT maintained street is, because that's consistent with what the current language requires. So that, that road connection would need to be improved up to the private access standards, as well as your new street, your new access, because that's okay. going to be a, a street too, most likely. All right, so let me kind of go on the opposite. I, I, those same 12 acres, let's suppose I want to cut a driveway I divide it into three four acre lots and I want a driveway for each one of those to access the DOT the the uh, existing road 
do the driveways have to meet the standards in C? If they are, if you can create it that, if you are, if it's a driveway, a true driveway, then no. But the road to that point should. Okay. So those three access points wouldn't have to meet the standards in C, but if I did one access point, it would. Well. It, it depends on how the, the 12 acres would lay out on the existing road. If you had enough room to create the lots on that private access street currently, then the way I interpret this language is that you would improve the road up to those new lots created. Okay. Anything past, if you go past that, you're just stuck with Sorry. the terrible road. How are we defining driveway? Well, not, not a street in this instance. So if I wanted a driveway a half mile long, how does that impact? It, it wouldn't. It wouldn't. It wouldn't. It would just be if Possibly you were creating driving. a new street to meet the requirements of the subdivision ordinance, then that street would need to meet the, st the standard. Standards. If it was a existing street, street would still have to meet those right. standards. Right. The existing street has to be improved. I just don't want five years down the road if staff were to be changed and somebody come in with a different interpretation. I'm sure it's spelled yeah. out the difference between a driveway and a road, right? And, it, and, well, and so if you come in, I think kind of what Owen's getting at, let's say you created a new uh, family subdivision with five lots. You carved that out of a 58 parcel, 50, 40 acre parcel and everybody got whatever acres. And he's saying what's the difference between putting a driveway down and then you turned into each lot or you so you you if you had a main road a main drive in you would consider that a road if it's required you have that, to tee off to create of that those at some lot, point yes. to create a driveway to get to your house right so there'll yeah. be a road and then a driveway off the road, driveway likely. is also a defined term in the ordinance and it mm -hmm. limits a driveway to serving two different lots so you could you couldn't have more than two lots served by a driveway no matter what you call it so what I'm thinking about is, let's say that I've got that parcel like Bob describes, and I want my lot in the very back, but I'm not subdividing it now. And then that I come in later on and subdivide it into a family subdivision. Got to bring it up. Why can't they just tie into my driveway? So long as it's only one lot, I think, tying into that. So, so there's no more than two lots tying into the driveway. Yeah, because you can share a driveway. Two homes. Yeah, two. Yeah. Rather. Well, I mean, the, the ordinance is requiring a lot width minimum requirement, too, which would generally be along a street, not a driveway. True. There you go. That, I mean, that, right. that's why. So let me just ask this question. So What we're really saying here is there's not going to be a limit to the total access points on these non-DOT roads if we adopt this. Am I right? Correct. For this, for parent parcels that are greater than 12 when you're creating lots that are at least three acres and, and you're meeting the requirements in this yeah. section. So if I live on an existing road now and I, and I know that only five houses or five access points are allowed right now correct only five right now that's correct currently on a private access street correct then there may be 20 before you know i sell my house there may be 20 at the i mean there could be potentially several access points five and then up to five and then 10 years later somebody else could divide it Okay. That is a possibility, yes. Okay. The 10 years, that 10 year was always there, right? No, the 10 year was put in place, the reset date on the parent parcel for family subdivisions, I believe it was 2013. Okay. So um, it's it somewhere been around 20, 2013. Right. So mm -hmm. it's been around for a number of years then. Okay. Yeah. So that's not new tonight. Before that, it was five. Right. Um, no. From 89, from 1989. All right, if I, now let me ask this, as far as this, um, I own five acres. Uh, Chairman White owns eight acres beside me, I buy it. Can you combine your parcels together if you have, you know, if you own both of those? I mean, how's that work? You can recombine the parcels. Um, 
I mean, to make that a family subdivision. Let me think no, well, about that. Well, and that's only on the expansion of, so what we're really talking about here is you've already got your five. And you buy your neighbor's property. You sell me eight right. acres beside me, and then I've, yeah, I've already got kids, your give it five. You mean you've got five acres? Five You're acres. asking about creating a 12 acre parcel that would then yeah, be able to qualify for this. Four lots on it. Um, let me think. I'm going to turn and <laughs> think. Yeah. Thanks, I've had that question. I've date, had that question come up twice. Would, that's why I asked. Would the date reset to that day that it was created into one parcel? Would that be the date that we'd look at? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks. That'd be the date it would look at when the parcel was when it was created Recombined. in that instance, in that specific instance. Yes. I've had that question asked twice. That's why I asked that. Can I answer? But you? tell him to call us. We'll, we'll talk to him. Right. We, we, we're happy to. <laughs> What's the benefit of a family subdivision? The, the benefit the benefit is is that um, as you can see it's uh, you can create more here. lots on a private access street it's the intent is to keep the land within the family within a family um, you don't have to travel far for the July 4th cookout I mean it doesn't have you know it's not a major it, it's not a major subdivision that would kick in other infrastructure <laughs> Correct, oh, yeah. Right. Other infrastructure, other paved road requirements, things like that. Okay, I own 100 acres, and I'm going to take and make me a family subdivision and give to my two daughters and my three grandkids. And adopt me. So in 10 years, I can do another set of acreage, right? Provide to the same people. Well, no, and that's I do, that's a good point. Is that when you create a family subdivision, and you convey that property to um, a family member within two de two degrees of kinship, each individual um, member gets one lot in their lifetime. So this is it's not something where you can then go in and give it to the same um, people again and again. Okay, but. You may have other heirs that you could give it to or, or other uh, people within a, two degrees of kinship that you could convey the property to. Um, so you could, it would reset in 10 years in that instance that you're saying. Okay, if I give it to my daughter who lives in Camden, what would prevent her from selling it the very next day? No. Nothing. Nothing. And I don't think there's anything we can do to prevent that. That's the one. That's the thing that you've probably sh struggled with the most, right? That's what we've heard is the probably the biggest problem is, is a cheap way for someone to create a little minor subdivision, yeah. an inexpensive yeah, so way. They don't have to go that, through. Right. So, that's yeah. one of the things that we currently kind of are concerned about. But with this particular provision, it's, it has to do with you know not only that, but then having more lots on a substandard road. Right. I get that. Um, that's, one Sorry. of the reasons we settled on you had to have a larger parcel, the 12 right. acres, and the, the family mm -hmm. plot that, that, that carved out after that five had to be a larger, so it just kind of decreased that ability to add 20 houses on there uh, as time went on. Well, some and some private access streets out there already have more than five, more than 10 lots that are accessing that street, and even those streets you can add Keep more adding. too. So we're not okay. All right. I think I'm at D if we're, <laughs> if we're ready to move on. Okay. You're at D. So part D, <laughs> back to the ordinance section 2.4.8 D2B, the proposed uh, part D under number four there. A certification by an NC licensed engineer shall be required on the recorded plat indicating that the existing and new streets meet North Carolina State Fire Code. So this provision ensures that the roads at the time of creation of the new lots um, met fire code requirements for supporting 75,000 pound fire apparatus and they include the required uh, fire truck turnarounds. E, all owners of existing private streets shall consent to the family subdivision application. Um, and, and this has already been talked about a little bit here tonight with some of your uh, questions. But currently, owners along a private access street have assurance that development that accesses the street will be limited unless the street is improved to DOT standards and turned over to DOT. When you, when you say that all owners of existing private streets will we'll just say it's a 60-acre parcel and I own 
50 acres and the other person owns 10 acres, just hypothetically. And then I don't do a family subdivision. I have four sons. So I have my 50 acres. I'm going to keep just say 10. And then I give them 10 apiece or whatever for my 50. Do I have to have permission from the guy that owns 10? For that private access street? It has to do with the street. It has to do with the street and how the street was created okay. and and who has the right to access that street and whether or not you have the right to create new lots on that street. Mm. Why, why, why are we giving veto power to somebody that has nothing to do with the property? That's taking away property rights. I mean, we, we require factual information on a special use permit. Nobody can stand up and say they don't, they're going to ruin my street. But yet here, we're letting an individual can be tit for tat and take away a person's right to do with their land what they want to. If we're going to do that, then let's give them the property tax bill and let them pay the person's taxes. Well, the same thing, too. You could say, like, road access. Of, you know, if people come over to Bob has a football weekend every weekend, it's 10, 10 of the like, You know, I'm just saying, as far as, like, this person could, you could own one parcel and nobody comes over to my house and eat. That's like my quiet time. You know what I'm saying? Just using that as an example as far as somebody coming down that road, the guy A could have. That's not. You know, that's, I'm just saying, but, but that's what I'm saying, like, the veto power. Like Mr. Well, that's that's a different. So that that goes back, I think, to the public dedication of the road, right? You can have people visit you anytime you want to at your your home if you want to have a Super Bowl party or whatever. What I'm saying is, what if that guy? You know, if you're saying you can't have these extra lots on the property, right? Then why would the road? Because that's going to create more traffic on the road. What if that guy has a party every week? I'm, well, I'm the, 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 the the property right is, issue is well. He, he, this is the issue: is that someone creating a family subdivision on a street for example they currently access their property through but they only have an easement to access their property that they now want to subdivide into five additional lots and so the the issue is whether you, to try to prevent someone from unwittingly buying a lawsuit uh, and by virtue of increasing the burden on the easement that that's only that's all the only right they have is to use that easement to access, access their property. lot their lot so the question then becomes is there a could there be a claim from the party who conveyed that easement to them or to others who ser or whose properties are served by the same easement to make a claim that you are increasing the burden or exceeding the purpose for which this easement was granted by creating five, ten, whatever number of lots, and and on top of that, the question: How do I, as a property owner who wants to now subdivide it into five additional lots and only have an easement to access my one lot, how do I convey access rights on an on a road to which only I have an easement? So that, that that that's some of the potential issue that that could arise. So we're right. opening a can of worms. Well, potentially, or or you know, frankly, it could be that you know, this, you take the position that's not going to be the county's concern, and 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 let the so property what? owners decide whether they are going to litigate or there is a legal so right to make a claim. Out. It's uh, so would is that typically how these roads are set up that they are they are held they're an easement granted to each property owner do, you, do we know that I, mean, I, I don't I don't know how we yeah, e yeah I don't know how each we don't know how each family access subdivision has been created over the years and what kind I mean it's one thing probably for example if it truly stays the lots stay in the hands of a family and there's an easement that's conveyed by granddad right. over the family land I mean that's one thing, but then if you start, if someone someone else comes in and starts uh, subdividing in, into more lots, their piece, and the only way to access those five additional lots are by gr the easement granted by Granddad to my one lot, 
Right. I mean, there, 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 there's some there's some potential legal issues there, and I think that's maybe planning staff's concern and issue that that has been raised along the way of analyzing this amendment. What rights does an easement generally convey? Well, generally, it's by the term by the terms of the easement. Usually spelled out. Um, you know, it, it sets out what. What right of ingress egress do I have, or am I am I conveyed by the uh, property owner to cross their land, for what purpose? And so, you know, the the instrument would have to be analyzed or evaluated to determine what what rights of ingress egress have been provided to me. So that would be a limiting factor right there in the creation of this. It it, it could be. So that's a protection that's already built into place, possibly. Sure, sure. But I, again, I think I think what staff's point was come, coming at it from an angle of on the front end, going ahead and clearing that, clarifying or clearing that issue out, as opposed to uh, approving the creation of a um, family subdivision, and that issue crop up sometime down the road, whether it's with the first family member to acquire the, uh, a lot or receive a lot or whether it's some unwitting, un unrelated person who has sold the lot somewhere down the road. With, with that to be in the case, is the county in any liability? Has any liability in that? No, I do not believe the county would have any liability. Okay, thank you. If it approved a family subdivision without requiring permission, I don't think the county would have any liability. So currently, Without this text amendment, if there's already five access points on that road, what are my options? If I have 30 acres and I want to subdivide it, what are my options? You could, you could bring the road up to DOT standards um, and then try to petition to have DOT take over that road and then from there you could create a private access street, street to that new DOT street. That street. I have to have everybody's on the road Not, permission? My understanding is it's 50% plus one to, to petition, petition DOT to add a road to their system. So you'd have to bring, but you'd have to spend a tremendous amount of money right. to bring that road up to DOT right. standards. Used to, you could post a bond and have yeah. it done. I don't think the standards are very high now. Um, <laughs> well. They're going to lessen them real quick when they can't pave anything. Um, it just seems like uh, having uh, item E in here is just a deal breaker. No matter, we might as well not go through this exercise. I mean, you'll never get five people on a street to allow you to. And in the case, like Selena was just talking about, when you get to, if you're at the end of that road, and you have a 20-acre parcel or 30-acre parcel, and you want to carve that up for your kids to move in and stay on the land in a, in a true spirit of what this is, it'll never happen. True. It'll never happen. We have a hard enough time getting us to agree to anything. Without a, without a limit on the number of access points. Now that might be a better way to look at it. Would that be a, I, I don't know, would that be like a, a grounds for a lawsuit between property owners I, that one person is interfering with the use and the um, the conflict, the, well, the, the, um, the, 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 the way the land looked before? Would that be, or the use of the land? Uh, I know we have to do the reasonableness statement um, that it won't have any adverse effects um, and that it's not in conflict with the UDO. Um, but would that, if we passed it, would it then be between the homeowners to, to go to court over it? Uh, over the, the, the cutting the, of more uh, access points into that road? I don't see that there would could be a claim, a successful claim against the county. No, no, between homeowners. Would that then be their only recourse is to sue the homeowner that wants to cut lots? To stop it. I mean, if they don't want them. It would depend on how the easement for it. Are you talking about the easement? The, 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 what, whether, whether there's a question about the exceeding the purpose for which the easement was granted? Right. 
I mean, I, that that would then be a civil matter between the homeowners. between the homeowners okay. or the, those. those. One, we've had one in the county. I know recently where it was, it was it, in the easement. How the easement was written, it said that he had to allow access to that individual's property, but it didn't say that he could have potholes. You know what I'm saying just he just said he had to have access. access. I've seen seen it and, and, and as a general rule, someone if some if I have an easement to to my property, I have the right as a holder of the easement to maintain and prove it. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have to I don't have to put up with potholes. I can go out there myself and put a tractor and, and prove it for the purpose for which it was granted. Right. Okay. Well, we've made it through E, I think. Okay. <laughs> F, an agreement specifying ownership and responsibility for the maintenance of existing and new streets shall be recorded prior to approval of the final plat. This provision was just to provide clarity for who owns the road, who is responsible for maintenance of the proposed and uh, existing street. And G, that the plat shall state that the lots created shall not be further su subdivided into family subdivision lots. And this provision is intended to prevent the continual creation of uh, family subdivision lots on substandard roads. So does G prevent that 10, year, 10 years later re resetting? For lots that were created through this particular type of family subdivision, yes. This is for lot six and on basically right lots what well it would be like for lots six seven and eight if it was three lots carved out right so right anything beyond the fifth lot gets gets section g you, you can't you can't cut it again way up on page 24 under c what would happen if somebody i guess it would be uh a county attorney question what would happen if I sold it to a non-family member I know it says it's a violation of the ordinance well I guess first of all it would be the county having to discover it <laughs> um, and then secondly I guess it would be it would be some enforcement action taken including an up to revocation of a plat or perhaps if a building permit had been issued a revocation of the Building permit. So you're just taking, if I had it and I divided it, you're just taking my word that they're my family members. Sure. I mean, I mean that, that is obviously the county, the county can't do a genealogical evaluation to determine. Do you think there's issues with some of these family subdivisions? I mean, I don't know if there's an issue. Uh, well, I think one, I know one in, in, recent, in the last couple of years where it was discovered that there had been a, a perhaps conveyance from the property owner to a non, a person not related within two degrees of kinship. And I think that one would be about, we suggested to fix it, to kind of unravel everything and then convey it out the proper way. I mean, it ended up, I think, the, the unrelated person ultimately received the lot again, but they did it through, went through. Uh, through the proper family channel. And I think we know of instances where um, even at a, a closing table where a parent conveys a deed to um, to child and child right there at that same table at the same closing conveys a deed to unrelated person, but there's nothing that prohibits that and we, we can't stop the free alienation of property at that point. Jenny. Back to me? Yes. <laughs> All right. So you've seen these uh, text amendment review standards. Donna went over some of these with a prior text amendment that you just heard. Um, and in deciding this text amendment and action on this text amendment, these are some of the standards that you can consider. Um, if it's consistent with the county adopted plans, the ordinance required by change conditions uh, addresses a community need, it's consistent with the zoning districts, results in a logical and orderly development pattern, and does not significantly, uh, significantly, uh, does not result in significantly adverse impacts on the natural environment. 
And so, <clears throat> staff, although, you know, staff does have some concerns with, with this amendment that were outlined in the staff memo, and we, we've tried to address some of those through the language. Uh, with uh, the language drafted, staff does recommend approval and suggests that the request is consistent with this land use plan policy, uh, TR-12, which is a transportation policy related to paved uh, roadways for residential developments. Um, specifically, I suppose it's consistent with the very last sentence of this policy that says family subdivisions and non-asphalt roads serving the northern beaches are the only exceptions to this policy. And the request is reasonable and in the public interest because it allows family subdivisions to create larger parcels with relaxed access standards for the purpose of keeping the land within the family. Uh, staff recommends approval of the, of the language as presented. Um, the planning board did recommend denial in a 3-2 vote. Um, they had some concerns about the potential for degrading substandard roads, uh, concern about the potential for increased commercial traffic, and there was a comment that you don't have to have commercially zoned property to have increased commercial traffic. They mentioned uh, crab shedding and mines, and the planning board did not think the text amendment uh, leads to a logical and orderly development pattern. Okay. Thank you. Anything further from Ms. Turner at this moment? All right. Uh, this is a, uh, a public hearing, and I do not have anyone signed up. I'm going to open up public comment. I do not have anyone signed up at the moment for public comment. Uh, there's a few members in the audience. Anybody this evening want to come up and talk about this? All right. Seeing no one, I will close public comment for this. And... Um, uh, ben, you and I hit on this beforehand. Uh, whether this passes or fails, or if it fails, it fails. But if it passes tonight, it doesn't actually pass tonight. Is that correct? No, this this is a UDO amendment, so okay. this would simple right. majority will, All right. will pass. All right. Do you request a time for a motion? Um, if you. Yeah, I don't entertain a motion or uh, if there's any further discussion from the board prior I, to the I motion. Just want, I just want to say that I just, I think this is a tough decision. I think it puts, um, puts it in between existing homeowners on the road and the use of the road and someone who truly wants to convey property to their family. And I mean, it could put neighbors at odds um, in many ways not just the use of the road. Um, I don't know if there's any way we can limit the number of access points on a non-DOT road. I know right now it's five, and maybe that's part of the problem, but to me, to leave it open um, is to create problems for existing uh, people on the road, and it seems like it would create problems for people who wanted to cut that in and for, and for people who may not be doing the right thing um may not convey it to family or may you know have other intent i, I just um and then i think there's problems with requiring everybody uh, as you use the term owen with the veto power that's a dangerous thing as well um, I, I don't know how you solve all the issues that this text amendment has surfaced, and, but it needs work. And that's, uh, you bring up uh, interesting, po great uh, observations and points, and um, we don't have the full complement of the board here either this evening. And as we've seen in the past, when there's been somebody gone and ends up in a stalemate, and then... Um, you know, perhaps uh, uh, something better might be that rather than going for an approval or denial tonight is to table this. Uh, I'll make a motion to table it. Well, Second. <laughs> <Gosh>. Discussion. <laughs> Mr. Attorney, could you put a designation on the plat that this is a family subdivision and have the Registry of Deeds Office verify that it is being transferred at least one time to a family member before they record a deed? Is that possible? First of all, I don't, I don't know how the Register of Deeds would be able to, to make a definitive determination of, of that any more than Have them sign an staff. affidavit that that is well, a family member? And, and then secondly, I, 
without looking at the statute, I don't, I don't know the answer right offhand, but uh, generally I think the Register of Deeds is required to record an instrument that has been properly probated or notarized um, and that otherwise meets our subdivision regulations. So I, I, don't, I don't know whether Register of Deeds would have the authority to deny uh, recordation of a, of a plat at that point after the county had approved it. That would be interesting. Once again, I I'm, I'm, would make a motion to table this. Maybe that's something we could investigate too. Um, I just think that this creates more problems than it solves as it's written right now. Okay. Um, what uh, we do need to set a date time, Lisa, you want to? Or if you want to kick it back completely to staff, uh, rather than, than bringing it back, uh, thank you. Would that mean it'd have to go back before the planning board if we kicked it back to Probably. staff? Mr. Chairman, I'd prefer for the board to go ahead and set a date okay. to at least have okay. further discussion. Hash it out. Okay. So we're we're going to table it and continue it. We're going to continue it too. Well, yeah, we will. I'm just uh, let's, so let's as part of Ms. First, Jarvis's uh, motion, she needs to set a date for this to be heard. Set the first Monday um, in September, or do we need more time? Let's go the second Monday in September. I don't know how much time we need. It, it, if it's I can just, really just ask a question, if I, yeah, if I can ask a question as the manager, yes. Um, when you say, do you need more time or less time? I don't know that staff has a whole lot of changes that they're going to make to the language without direction from the board. This is about us having discussion as a board. Okay. So this this item would remain open until we come back together and hear it again as old business. And first, then the first meeting in August. Okay, which would be the second. Yeah, sure. Okay. All right. So I make a motion to table this item until August second. Thank you. Second. You second that. Did we need to rescind the original motions? She made a motion and Kitty seconded, but it wasn't clear on the date. Well, I, I think um, so long as you would still, your second would stand to, I guess, the modified motion. Okay. All right. Uh, any further discussion from the board? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. All right. We have one nay. Thank you. All right. Anybody well, want to uh, take five after this one? Yeah. Yes. yeah. Okay. Let's take five minute recess then. Thank you. <laughs> Item A: Consideration of an action of action on an ordinance for the Kirtuck County Board of Commissioners, amending Chapter Two, Article Three, Division Ten. Historic Preservation Commission of the Kirtuck County Code of Ordinances to conform with Chapter 160D of the General Statutes of North Carolina to make technical corrections. Mr. Mr. Chairman, I would like to make, make it known to the board that I have been working with Jenny. Uh, my daughter inherited the twin house in Shawboro, and we have been working a little bit with the house uh, because the house is on the National Register of Historical Places. So I don't know if I should recuse myself or not. No, I, I, well, for, for, first of all, the general rule in the statutes is that a commissioner is required to vote on every matter coming before them unless there indeed is a financial uh, conflict or it's an issue about their, their character. Um, and, and the proposed amendments here won't have an impact or any effect whatsoever in, in your daughter's renovation of a historic structure. It looks technical well, in, in fact, as I, as I get into it, I'll, I'll just go ahead <laughs> and uh, refer you to page 10. You were provided with the entire ordinance so you could get the context of what was being modified, mm -hmm. but the changes begin, uh, amendments begin on page 10. Well, I said the ordinance. I don't know what it is in your agenda package. I'm 31. And if you look at line... Uh, two through 12, you'll see the strikeout and underlying language. Uh, what, what it's doing for, as regard in, to section 2-276 for the technical amendment is just changing county planning director to commission staff um, and then 
that, that, the, that the Historic Preservation Commission will act in accordance with standards adopted by the commission as opposed to the language existing talking about the administrative manual, manual and the UDO. Um, and line nine, it, it, it's just, it's just a, a better word crafting so the commission may require uh, the submittal with the application of pertinent information sufficient to determine an applica application's completeness uh, and then making clear that incomplete application shall not be uh, accepted. And if you go to the bottom of, of that page, line 38, this is a modification that, that would uh, provide rather than an appeal from the Historic Preservation Commission decision going to the Board of Adjustment, it, it would provide that the uh, grieving party go directly to Superior Court. And then the, the, the major change as required by Chapter 160D amendments to the North Carolina General Statutes, which you dealt with at your last meeting with extensive uh, amendment to the UDO, the, the Chapter 160D also requires uh, that a code of ethics uh, be included or provided uh, for historic preservation commissions, boards of adjustments, uh, bo boards of county commissioners, uh, essentially any, bo any body or entity or commission that is dealing with land use matters. And so uh, on, page, uh, on page 11, at least of the, of the original draft, at line 19 begins a new section 2-278 that provides for a code of ethics, which reads the same as the code of ethics language you amended and added to the UDO at your last meeting. And so this uh, ordinance amendment is recommended to you by staff for your adoption. Do note that this is an ordinance that requires unanimous vote to be adopted at this meeting. Of course, that standard cannot be met tonight. But if you uh, proceed to, uh, to uh, approve it, uh, then it will come back to you at your next meeting, at which time it may be adopted by a simple majority. Okay. Any questions? I'll entertain a motion if the board uh, would like to make one. One question, quick question. Yes, sir. The code of ethics, is there any requirement for um, like continuing education on that or certification that they've passed? That there is nothing that the General Assembly is required in the general statute. I mean, certainly if, if you wanted to add that as Curry Tuck County's requirement, uh, you could. What are you thinking, Owen? I don't think it would hurt to have that particular section put into some type of written form that when a, the commission members sign a document that they will adhere to the code of ethics. To to the code of ethics set forth in the in, in the ordinance. Sure, that, that could certainly maybe be added at, at uh, line twenty in, in new section two dash. 278A, before entering their duties, commission members shall qualify by taking an oath of office pursuant to GS 160D-309 uh, and signing a, what is it that you, signing a statement that they have read and understand the code of ethics? Sure. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Would you like to make that as a motion? I will make that as a motion to amend the Ordinance as written. Okay. Any further discussion from the board? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. Thank you all. Next agenda item is item B, consideration and action on a resolution of the Kirtuck County Board of Commissioners accepting American Rescue Plan Act funds. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, a part of the... Um, the ARP funds that are coming out is that you have to formally adopt a resolution accepting them and laying out certain guidelines that you'll follow as you spend that money. One of the big one being it's got to be in a separate fund. It's got to be accounted for based on federal guidelines. It, in communities that are coastal communities, there's a lot of similarity to the way that we have to spend FEMA money as an example. So no concern there. Um, just so everybody knows, the American Recovery Plan funds, roughly $5.38 million, it'll be coming to Currituck County. 
Um, there's a myriad of ways that you can use it, but probably the simplest way to use it is for infrastructure investment. Um, that can be for um, water, sewer, or broadband. Um, in North Carolina, there's some challenges with investing in broadband, but some of the regional planning agencies are trying to get some ideas together and get some state approvals that maybe you'll be able to move forward. So I would anticipate that ours would be, moved, would be used in one of those infrastructure arenas just because that is the simplest way and the quickest way to be able to spend that money down. Um, but with that, the resolution just officially accepts that money and then says that the county will follow proper accounting, contracting, and reporting um, rules as we use it. Happy to answer any questions. Questions? Does someone like to make a motion? Move for approval. Second. Thank you. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Uh, next item on the agenda is item D. Um, another resolution of the Board of Commissioners authorizing design, build, construction, delivery method for the construction of a public works facility. Skip C. Is that a skip C? Yeah. My apologies. Back up. I'm happy checking tonight. Uh, resolution of the uh, Kirtuck County Board of Commissioners authorizing design, build, construction, delivery method for the expansion of the mainland and southern Outer Banks water system water treatment plants. Uh, essentially, this is a resolution that allows us to use the design build method of construction uh, so that we have a team together in the design and construction phase that starts together and finishes the project. Uh, we've seen the use of that um, method of delivery in the public safety building as an example. We, we feel like it works really well, especially where you're in some um, kind of very specific design criteria. And we would use that on both of, we're going to be doing an expansion on both of the water plants over the next year um, to be able to treat more water. Be happy to answer any questions. Questions? What, 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 what? Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, on to D this time. Um, the resolution of the, uh, the Kirtuck County Board of Commissioners authorizing design, build, construction, delivery method for the construction of the public work facility. Uh, it's kind of the same thing I said last time. It's a, it's a construction method. This would actually be for a, a public works facility. It'll be mainly warehouse space, but will house somewhere between four and five offices. But it'll more than likely be a simple metal building. Um, and it'll look a lot like your, your airplane hangars, if you kind of picture that. It'll be situated right there by the airport. Um, so that we can store, you know, as we get into bulk purchases so that we can save money on mm -hmm. things like toilet paper cleaner, that kind of thing. But this basically lets us use design build for the construction of that project. Be happy to answer any questions. Move for approval. Thank you. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? All right. Item E, consideration and action of a ground lease between Kirtuck County and Mike Hockett of, for location of a hangar at Kirtuck County Regional Airport. Mr. Chairman, this is a lease coming to you similar to a lease that the, the board approved, I guess maybe a year ago for a similar project, which has apparently been successful as I believe the tenant in that matter is about completed, if, if he hasn't already completed his hangar for location of uh, probably two uh, aircraft. Uh, this this is, would be a, lease, a similar lease agreement with a gentleman named Mike Hockett out of Chesapeake, Virginia for the lease of a, an area of 3,600 square feet in size for the construction and maintenance of a hangar for the housing of his aircraft. Um, it's the same type of term as the previous one. There would be an initial 10-year term with four additional five-year uh, terms for a possible total of 30-year uh, lease term. Uh, it begins with a $504 uh, per year uh, lease payment, which would escalate by 3% each year going forward during the lease term. That may sound like a, a low amount of, of uh, revenue coming in through the lease, but the idea, of course, is, again, to generate uh, more activity at the airport, the sale of fuel, and also the tax revenue expected from the, base, uh, the basing of right. uh, valuable aircraft at the airport. Um, and so the airport manager and staff recommend that the board approve this lease agreement. Move for it. approval. Thank you. Is it worse? Is, kind of, is that is it ranked right beside the one that just about? Uh, yeah, I think it's, yeah, it's going to be right right down that way. Yeah. So we have a motion. Second. Thank you, uh, Kitty. All right. <coughs> All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. Uh, board appointments. Item F. We got the uh, um, first one is the ABC board. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to appoint Chris Bell to the ABC board. Okay, thank you. Second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. 
Any opposed? All right. Uh, item two, uh, Animal Services and Control Advisory. Thanks. Kevin, is that your, uh, did you have somebody? Nancy yes. Bank, please. Uh, Laura Hill. Yeah, Laura Hill. Page. There we go. Page 89. They are. Would anyone else like? Wait, Nancy please. <laughs> <laughs> Animal Service Control Advisory Board. Thank you. I'll second, second. those. Okay. All right. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Uh, uh, all right. Uh, Board of Adjustment. I think Mike needed, that was Mike's appointment, was it not? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. So um, I guess we can uh, move that to, uh, I'll move to um, table that, continue that until our next meeting in uh, January, which was the, or August, excuse me, which was the second. And uh, let Mike make that appointment. So I need a second to my motion to move that. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. And we're not gonna, we can amend the agenda if you want to, to include it is okay. All right, we have an agenda now. That's right. You're supposed to send out their packet to the board. Thank you. All right, uh, Gene, uh, consent agenda. Move for approval. Second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Uh, Any opposed? All right. <laughs> and uh, we'll join the regular. Meeting of the Board of Commissioners and opening a special meeting of the Tourism Development Authority. And uh, what do we need to move? We need a motion. We need a motion. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Uh, I will now open the special meeting of the Tourism Development Authority. And the item there on tonight is a consideration of grant recommendations uh, of, for tourism event assistance. And is Tamara still here? She is. Thanks for hanging out with us tonight, Tamara. Well, right. Thank you very much. Place. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Um, I believe in your board packets, you have the recommendations from the Tourism Advisory Board. Um, they're recommending uh, pretty much full funding except for the OBX treasure hunt, but they do recommend some funding for that. So I'm here to answer any questions you might have about those grants. I think it's really exciting. I'm glad we got to do it again, finally. <laughs> I'm take a year off. You know, Peach Festival did go ahead and um, we grandfathered the 2019 grants over to 2020. Mm -hmm. So the Peach Festival had a very successful event back in June okay. and they turned in all of their information, um, their accountability forms for that and that has been sent on to finance to cut a check for them. You mean 2021 this year? Yes, two sorry. sorry. Well, yeah. yeah. Right. It's been a long 21. <laughs> um, okay, uh, well, nothing, just a comment. Looks like we've got some new stuff happening. Some people are thinking about uh, different stuff, mm -hmm. which is great, which was the intent of this, is to encourage people to um, want to have these events and uh, create stuff to do within the county. So. And I'm glad to see some of it safely locked down. Right. Yeah. No, who knew? Uh, if not, Tom, I'll be the. <laughs> well, we will be. <laughs> Um, with the Christmas in Kerala Village, um, we as the tourism uh, department, is we are also going to be piggybacking off of that particular event and we're going to be lighting up part of the park. Not Kerala Island so much because we want to keep that rather authentic. Um, although we have talked to the curator and she's on board with us lighting up the big oak tree in front. And most of that lighting will be up lighting, not actually lighting within the trees. And Carl Canute, who does the uh, Roanoke Elizabethan Gardens uh, Festival of Lights, is actually helping us with that. So he's our he's our advisor, and he's helping us um, to create what I think will be a really special event um, for both Twitty and Company and for the tourism department. And we intend to grow that every year. So will you kick it off with something like the Grand Illumination they do in Williamsburg? Um, I think that's the intent, that we want to light it up all at once. 
Um, we're, we're still sort of in the planning phases. Um, most importantly, with all of these lights, particularly on our side of it, is Twitty and Company has offered to store our lights for us. So that, that's really a, a kind of a big boon there. Um, we were a little worried about where we we're going to put all those lights. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, well, um, any, anything else from Ms. Tamron this evening? All right. Well, I'll, uh, I'll make a motion to uh, approve those grant recommendations um, as presented. Um, okay. Uh, thank you. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Can I have a motion to adjourn the meeting, please? Move. Second. Kevin? Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Thank you all for a good meeting. And let me hang out in the middle again.